It will be discussed in the WTO Balance of Payments Committee on 22nd of 29th of April next week. However, I do not expect major opposition to it, as the WTO administration has assessed the measures to be consistent <coughs> with the WTO agreement on balance of payments. Since it appears consistent with the WTO, we see no conflict with our free trade agreement. But we are still awaiting notification from Ukraine under our agreement. It is too early to predict the implications of this on trade, but it is clear that it is the EU that will suffer the most, as, as all the has, uh, has, uh, has uh, uh, mentioned, they, at, at, uh, as of today, have duty-free access um, in, in Ukraine, in almost all sectors. For our seafood trade, this means a 10% duty from the zero in the, in the FDA. And this could further complicate trade. Norway supplies the present 30% of the Ukrainian seafood market. However, these are extraordinary measures, temporary in nature, 
And as long as they are consistent with Ukraine's international obligations, we can only offer our support and hope that it helps improving their balance of payments situation. We welcome and support the reform agenda in Ukraine, and we have in particular great hopes for reforms that aim to fight corruption. It is our impression that corruption is a major challenge for Norwegian companies that wish to invest or engage in trade in Ukraine. As uh, Sigmund mentioned, uh, uh, are we, we are pleased that an agreement between Norway and Ukraine on the establishment of a bilateral commission on trade, business and economic cooperation was signed during Prime Minister Solberg's visit in Kiev 18 November last year. We find it very useful to meet regularly at the political level to, how to discuss how we can promote the widening and deepening of our economic cooperation. The needs of the Norwegian business community with activities in Ukraine, including those trading with fish and seafood, was an important aspect for us when we decided to respond positively to Ukraine's authorities' suggestions to establish such a commission. From our side, we certainly hope to see the commission gather annually and that sessions will repre represent an arena where opportunities and challenges in our bilateral economic relations can be discussed on, at a political level. The Commission will be headed by a State Secretary from our Ministry. The, the Ukrainian side has not yet appointed it, its Head of Commission, but the Ministry of Economic Development is responsible, the responsible Ministry for the Commission on the Ukrainian side. At the introductory meeting that took place in, in Kiev in November last year, the parties agreed to conduct the first ordinary session in the Commission by November this year here in Norway. This is the uh, ambition and intention of both sides. A little bit unclear whether the Ukrainian side will be, will be able to do it, out of reasons that we all can understand. But, but we rely on input, input from, and in the longer term, also participation from the Norwegian and Ukrainian business communities in future uh, Commission sessions. I mentioned that Norway welcomes the reform agenda introduced by the decision makers in Kiev. Norway has on several occasions, including during Prime Minister Solberg's visit to Kiev in last year, offered support to Ukraine in its efforts to reform and modernize the country. Fighting corruption, as I have indicated, must be an integral part of the reform agenda. As for my ministry, the Minister of Trade and Industry and Fisheries, we have since entering into force of the FTA between EFTA and Ukraine, had a bilateral cooperation in the field of fisheries, based on a joint statement between Ukraine Norway and Iceland. Our Minister has also offered support to the food safety and veterinary authorities and we are pleased that Ukraine has responded, responded positively to this proposition. The mentioned cooperation between our two countries in these areas was on the, on the agenda during the talks between a delegation from the Ukrainian Minister of Agrarian Policy and Food and our Ministry in Oslo early in March this year. It was agreed that the Norwegian delegation will travel to Kiev as soon as possible on a fact-finding mission and to meet things with relevant food safety and veterinary authorities. In order to get the most of our resources, it is important to coordinate Norwegian efforts in this field with that of the EU and other important donor, co donor countries. We have started this work with our European colleagues. We are aware that Ukraine lost parts of its capacity within its own fishery sectors when Crimea was annexed by Russia last spring. We are therefore particularly pleased to observe good progress in the bilateral cooperation with Ukraine in the field of fisheries, that also includes Iceland. The Ukrainian delegation I mentioned earlier also visited Bergen, where a possible expansion of the fisheries cooperation was discussed with the Director of the Fisheries, the Marine Institute, the Coast Guard, National Institute of Nutrition and Seafood Research, and the Pelagic Sales Organizations, Norges Sildesalslag, or it's Noregs for the Sildesalslag, actually. For 2015, it has been tentatively agreed to broaden this cooperation with and support to the fisheries and seafood authorities in Ukraine. We have proposed specific projects between the Marine Institute and the Directorate of Fisheries and their Ukrainian counterparts for 2015. The final decision, however, on, the, on financial support in this area has not yet been taken. So I hope for a positive answer from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
As you understand from my short introduction, our ministry has quite a few activities going on to support Ukraine in times of trouble and to enhance the bilateral economic cooperation for mutual benefits for both countries. We would like to see increased business cooperation between our two countries, but I should stress at the end that we'll always be on the business own initiatives. I mean, it will, you will have to come, will have come up with ideas and uh, define the needs based on your market analysis and your interest. So I wish to all the best in your future work. Thank you. Mr. Feinberg is uh, leaving uh, quite soon. So I will be here till the break. Till the break, the break yes. Yeah. But there will be no possibility to discuss things with him. So, yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Farberg, for an interesting presentation, and thank you, Arpin, for this information as well. My name is Oleg Rabovetsky. I am first secretary of the Embassy of Ukraine on economic and consular affairs, and uh, pending the arrival of new ambassador, I am Sharjet Affair of Ukraine in Norway. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to provide more information on what was said earlier. For example, I would like to start with the um, economic, economic statistics. Uh, I know that Norway has it in Norwegian krona, we make it in US dollars. So to be more correct, I will speak in percentage. Fishery is very important in our trade and uh, during the results, according to results of the first three quarters, the fishery amounted almost to 70% of Ukrainian import from Norway. Due to the beginning of the uh, export of Norwegian oil and gas to Ukraine, which helped us to diversify our um, energy supply and strengthen our uh, energy security, during only the last, uh, the last quarter, the amount of uh, gas delivered to Ukraine amounts to almost 52%. And uh, I'm, I agree with uh, Mr. Farberg that uh, fishery is 30% down, that's right. At the same time, if we take it in amounts which were delivered, in reality it is 77% up. But due to the great delivery of Norwegian gas, it's, of course it's lower almost twice. Uh, I can agree again with the trade in services, that in this area Ukraine has a surplus, um, but it's, it's a bit lower in comparison with the previous years, that's true. Another information is about the head of the uh, Intergovernmental uh, Commission for Trade and Economic with Ukraine and Norway. Its head from Ukrainian side has already been appointed, it will be the Minister for Energy, and uh, I think it's very much due to our strong cooperation in this sector. And at the same time, as far as I know, during the, our visit of the delegation on the agriculture, there was kind of previous agreement to create a subgroup on agriculture cooperation. So I, I'm sure that in this area we will strengthen our cooperation and we'll be working on diversification. Uh, the most important issue last year was to diversify as fishery was 77%. Right now we did it a bit, but we see that almost 85% are covered by two groups. So diversification is uh, still uh, the important thing in our trade and economic cooperation. And uh, I'm grateful to the Norwegian uh, Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce for arranging this event and uh, inviting <laughs> interesting uh, guests from Ukraine and uh, I congratulate the Chamber with this stream broadcast. It's a very great achievement for this organization and it will provide more people with information about our bilateral trade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to say that, uh, I mean, when, when we compare trade statistics with other countries, bilateral trade, they never match with any country, so it's normal. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Then um, 
Thank you, Mr. President. And now we to one of the organizers, or actually those who take the initiative. I think it took the initiative to, to, to have this conference. And uh, okay, I, I'd like to present or maybe <laughs> introduce Lana Sinishkina, uh, who can take talk about the opportunities. So please, Lana. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any sound? Yeah? Um, first of all, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, the NECC Chamber, uh, to the Nor Norwegian Embassy, and uh, also to the uh, law firm Vigbor uh, Ryan for this opportunity to present Ukraine here and to tell about uh, a little bit more about uh, the opportunities which the free trade agreement ta uh, brings for both countries. And uh, thank you very much, Arnfin, for your presentation. It was also very uh, encouraging. And um, very, uh, you, you really uh, showed a good understanding of the situation in Ukraine, both challenges and uh, opportunities. Um, and thank you to uh, Norwegian people who really support Ukraine and Ukrainian people in their, um, in their wishing to achieve more democracy and to, uh, to achieve uh, better results in Ukraine and Europe. Okay. Uh, we will talk about recent developments in Ukraine. We will talk about the EFTA agreement itself, uh, opportunities, challenges, why doesn't it work uh, to the full extent. Uh, we will talk about recent developments in Ukrainian legislation and reforming. And uh, we'll also talk about the situation in Crimea and so-called occupied territories, uh, territories of uh, eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, and um, we'll talk about agriculture agreements as well. Uh, here you see, uh, you know very well about the revolution dignity. I want to, to stress once again that this is revolution of dignity, not the colorful revolution, whatever, but uh, this is how the Ukrainian people uh, showed <coughs> to the Ukrainian government uh, that uh, they should take into consideration uh, those uh, promises which have been given to Ukrainian people before. Uh, this is one of the days uh, of the Ukrainian revolution. Then you know that we've had a power shift. Uh, the ex-president, Mr. Yanukovych, um, escaped from the country. And we've had uh, uh, president elections. Uh, as a result of them, uh, Mr. Poroshenko took the position of president. That was uh, one uh, stage presidential elections. So the people of Ukraine united uh, in this point and uh, gave their votes for the president, Mr. Mr. Poroshenko. Uh, then, uh, shortly after that, the Ukrainian uh, EU association agreement has been signed finally. And uh, um, the uh, several parts of the EU associ association agreement have already enacted in Ukraine. Uh, the DCFT part, uh, which uh, belongs to uh, free trade uh, free trade area, will uh, will uh, uh, enter into force in uh, 2000, uh, 2016, from the first January. Uh, then we've had uh, elections to the new parliament of Ukraine, and you probably know that uh, this time it was the first time when absolutely new faces came into the parliament from business, from civil society, from expert society. Uh, not so many as we would like to have, but still there is a change. And after that we've had uh, new faces uh, in the government. Uh, several of the new ministers came from abroad. Uh, now they're already Ukrainian citizens, so they took Ukrainian citizenship. Uh, here are the Minister of Finance, Minister of Health, uh, Minister of Economy. We also have, uh, I think, around now, around 20 new uh, deputy ministers in different ministries who are absolutely new, uh, coming from business, from senior positions in different international Ukrainian business, which is very good, I guess. Uh, two representatives of these uh, new faces are here. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, to introduce you, Mr. <laughs> Dmitry Schulmeister, who is uh, uh, head of the department uh, uh, in, uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture of Ukraine, and also Mr. Uh, Denis Gutenko, who is uh, um, also uh, head of the department in the Ministry of Economy of Ukraine. Both, uh, both um, 
uh, government officials now uh, came from business, from senior positions, and uh, we have absolutely different language now talking to government in Ukraine, thanks to this. Um, also very important uh, thing which has been changed that the voice of civil organization, expert society and business society is now absolutely different. Um, a lot of business associations, civil association are very active right now in Ukraine and uh, they push government, push parliament, uh, they uh, create by themselves the reforming agenda, they create draft laws, they uh, promote these draft laws by all means they can. And this is what actually gives the most results in Ukraine. And this is why I believe in Ukraine most of all. Uh, not because of uh, the government which has been changed, not because of uh, legislation which has been changed, but just because of those people uh, who started uh, absolutely different uh, approach in Ukraine in cooperation with government, in cooperation with business, and uh, actually promoting the development of Ukraine by themselves. Uh, of course, a uh, very important role is played by the international organization institutions in Ukraine right now. The World Bank, International Monetary Fund, uh, USAID, European Bank and many others who support Ukraine and support not only by, fu uh, by funds, uh, by technical assistance, but also uh, kind of produce control over the reforms and over the actions of the government, which is very important. And, uh, for example, why I was one of the members uh, of the groups uh, in, uh, of business society in Ukraine. We traveled to Georgia, to USA, and talked to the representatives of these organizations. And uh, they really paid of attention to what the business says in Ukraine. And they accept the information we produce, and they, uh, then they uh, push this into the gov government negotiations. Um, of course, uh, we can say that a lot of problems uh, are in Ukraine uh, with reforming and we would like to have more rapid reforms, more reasonable reforms, etc. But uh, I can't, mention, uh, can't, can't but mention the, uh, those achievements which have been already done in Ukraine. Um, first, there were uh, first steps in the regulation. Here are only a few of them, and this process is, uh, is, is continuing all the time. Uh, a lot of the regulation steps have been taken by Minister of Economy, Minister of, of Agriculture. Uh, in taxation, uh, not, not very good in situation, actually, you know that uh, the taxation system is uh, burdensome in Ukraine, but at the same time, there are, uh, there are new steps uh, in the reduction of the number of taxes. Uh, the electronic administration of VAT has been introduced uh, and um, also other actions which are promoted by Minister of Finance right now uh, are being done uh, in Ukraine. Uh, judicial reform is very important because if the country doesn't have the uh, judicial system which is uh, uh, reliable, of course, we can't say about investments. Um, Maybe you know we have a new, brand new law on judicial reform, uh, which provides a new system of selection of the judges, of estimation, assessment of the ju uh, judgment, and uh, also a um, few uh, procedural changes which, w which shall uh, improve the judicial uh, system in Ukraine. Very important anti-corruption reform. Um, very important thing which has been done in this year that uh, the criminal liability of legal entities uh, has been enacted, which means that not only the natural person can be uh, subject to criminal liability, but also the entities. Um, meaning that, uh, for example, in those cases when there are substantial uh, infringement uh, on the part of uh, the entities, like collusion and tenders, etc., etc., uh, the now the, the companies should uh, pay more attention to compliance in Ukraine. Uh, we have a number of new regulations in anti-corruption legislation, like uh, regulating gifts, uh, whistleblowing, which is a very new institution for Ukraine. Um, we have new registers open. Uh, now we have a public register of so-called uh, 
corru corruption of offenders, uh, all the natural person and legal entities which uh, committed co uh, corruption offenses uh, will be entered into this register, and this is public. So this is also uh, one of the um, uh, anti-corruption new anti-corruption tools in Ukraine. A uh, very important uh, part of this anti-corruption system reform is uh, new uh, enforcement agencies. Uh, maybe you heard about very long but transparent and open process of selection uh, for the position of the chairman of the new uh, anti-corruption bureau, National Anti-Corruption Bureau, which is now the final stage. Uh, one more body is not, uh, National Anti-Corruption Agency. They have uh, split the function between these two bodies. And also we have a um, new, um, new uh, type of uh, uh, new department within the prosecutor's office, which, is, uh, which will be uh, devoted to anti-corruption uh, offenses. Uh, agriculture reform is very important for, for this audience and for this uh, uh, relationship. Uh, we know that the uh, uh, number of permits in agriculture has been cancelled this year and uh, as far as I know there is a, uh, there is a number of other licenses and permits which are on the, on the agenda which will be simplified or cancelled. So this is uh, good news. Uh, and a uh, few other uh, deregulation uh, steps have already, be already been undertaken by agricultural ministry. Um, you see uh, here is uh, the Minister of Agriculture presented the uh, strategy for the uh, development for the five years period and you can see the main points of this uh, strategy. Now, uh, if talking about uh, EFTA Ukraine trade agreement, first of all I would like to <coughs> stop on uh, the figures. Here you see uh, the main figures of ex export and import operations uh, with uh, Iceland, Norway and Switzerland. Switzerland is uh, like more successful in this, but Norway is also uh, the second uh, country uh, based on these figures. Uh, here is the uh, within the EFTA. Uh, export, this was uh, export and this is import <coughs> products. The comparison is made between the 2009 and 2013 because two 2014 figures are not available uh, right now. Uh, but I think that uh, it could be already, you know, observed the attendance. Um, and here is uh, the figures on Norway. Uh, yes, it's very, it's very uh, true that the, the export import operation have to be uh, diversified um, in the future. Mm. These are also more figures. Uh, we will then send my presentation, so if you are interested in these figures and to, an to make analysis of them, uh, so you would be, uh, there would be opportunity. <coughs> Uh, the main questions uh, out of these figures arise, uh, do real uh, companies understand uh, the uh, opportunities which are given uh, by the FTA agreement? Does the FTA agreement <coughs> really work? And uh, if, if there are some defects, uh, how, can they, how, can, how can we identify them and correct? And um, uh, maybe some procedures should be improved uh, within the FTA uh, implementation. Here is the short uh, history of the uh, agreement. Uh, you know that uh, in 2012 it has been enacted, so now we have a three-year three period uh, when we can judge about the uh, uh, actual, actual uh, implementation of the agreement. Uh, what is important to know that this kind of agreement was the first one between, uh, in, in for Ukraine which introduced the uh, economic integration, not just uh, free trade provisions, but the economic integration, having uh, a lot of regulations on different areas. Um, and uh, on this slide uh, you can see the main uh, <coughs> governmental bodies of Ukraine who are responsible for implementation of the agreement and with the particular websites. Um, 
at this slide I show I try to show uh, the intention which I really I, I think that there was when introducing this agreement um, you can see that uh, actually integra economic, economic integration between Ukraine and EFTA uh, countries is, it was not the only purpose of this uh, agreement uh, because a lot of provisions of the agreement um, concern also EU countries, the countries which uh, belong to different other, other different uh, uh, economic agreements. And uh, since the Ukraine also has uh, its particular uh, FTA agreements with, uh, for example, CIS countries, um, the primary uh, intention of this agreement was to integrate uh, more uh, countries rather than only Ukraine and EFTA. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fa fact, uh, this doesn't work to the full extent. And I think this is the perspective of this agreement. Uh, this is a short overview of the content of the agreement. Uh, what should be said also is that the uh, Ukrainian agreement, uh, EFTA agreement, uh, is kind of a part of uh, the WTO agreement. <coughs> it's a, a, a way to reinforce the WTO agreement and to make more new uh, arrangements and uh, obligations on Ukraine <coughs> and EFTA. Um, here are the main um, bilateral uh, bodies which should be uh, should be uh, should take place. Joint committee uh, has been organized and is active. Uh, this is the main body within this agreement. Uh, but uh, I can't say that it's a very uh, active body. And uh, as far as I understand, that this year they should uh, have a sitting. Uh, based at least based on the provision of the agreement. Uh, the agreement also foresees that uh, several subcommittees uh, should be established uh, and working group depends on the topics and areas uh, as well as the arbitration panel. If something goes, goes wrong with the uh, commitments of any side, the, all these disputes should be um, uh, transferred to arbitration panel. Uh, so this is a short overview of the institutional basis of the agreement. Um, of course, one of the main uh, purpose of the agreement was to reduce duties to, uh, to uh, promote trading in, in goods and services and uh, to uh, establish a national treatment regime and uh, most favored nation uh, treatment re regimes for the goods of the, of the countries. Um, if talking about the goods, uh, you probably know that uh, a lot of most all types of goods are, uh, uh, are regulated by the agreement. But of course, uh, we have the most uh, important for the countries, as you can see. And um, uh, the, the agreement regulates also the, uh, the issue of uh, market access. One of the uh, questions which arises at this point is the sanitary and phytosanitary measures which uh, uh, concern uh, food products. Um, the agreement itself doesn't have a separate regulation on the sanitary and phytosanitary measures, but it uh, refers to, uh, to the WTO agreement, uh, which provides a, s a basis for improvement and uh, development of uh, the joint recognition system uh, between Ukraine and uh, and the, the countries. Um, also, uh, EU association agreement, uh, which has been signed recently, provides a very detailed uh, roadmap on uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures in, uh, um, implementation uh, between the countries. Uh, as far as I know, Minister of Agriculture uh, deals with this aspect and has a schedule of um, uh, by which it will mo move forward uh, in a joint recognition system. Rules of origin is also a very important thing, and this is where you can you will see other countries, uh, except for uh, Ukraine and FTA countries. Uh, the agreement um, provides that uh, not only that uh, uh, the goods uh, get um, uh, 
uh, preferences and duties uh, which are originated from Ukraine or EFTA agreement. At the same time, uh, the, the agreement uh, provides more uh, opportunities for mm -hmm. goods accumulating, meaning that uh, if, the good, if, if the goods are made of the materials which uh, originate from uh, EU countries or from um, uh, former Yugoslavian Republic uh, countries or from Turkey, uh, and have a certain uh, manufacturing process been done in Ukraine or FT, they will be considered as uh, the, the goods originating from Ukraine or FT, FT respectively. But this has not uh, been implemented at the moment, uh, so the certificate which would uh, uh, confirm uh, ori origination uh, from these countries is, is called Euromed certificate, it doesn't work. Uh, neither in Ukraine nor in uh, EFTA for Ukrainian trade. Uh, so this is where more development and more implementation should be done. This is how these uh, documents look like. Uh, Euro 1 certificate and invoice declaration which are in place already in Ukraine and could be, uh, uh, could be uh, uh, used uh, for uh, trade under this agreement. I will not stop on customs duties. Uh, you can see it depends on the, the goods, and we have a significant reduction in, on, on a number of goods. Uh, we have a total uh, abolishment of uh, certain uh, duties, so uh, if you are interested in a particular good, you have to follow the schedules. Um, uh, the agreement also provides for rules of establishing uh, different uh, restrictive <coughs> measures, such as anti-dumping <coughs> measures, global safeguard, bilateral safeguard measures. They are all regulated by WTO agreement. And um, during the, the latest history of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine um, applied several uh, restrictive measures, safeguard measures. You can see a few of them on this slide. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, in 2014, uh, due to uh, EFTA agreement, uh, one of the restriction measures uh, was excluded uh, from uh, the, the EFTA countries, just uh, so because of application of one of the clause of the agreement, which is important. Trading services. Um, I will not uh, talk a lot on this uh, because. Uh, is, is regulated by the respective WTO agreement and the EFT agreements provides for a sp special schedule of the uh, um, statements uh, of the countries in this respect. We have a separate regulations for financial and telecommunication services. Uh, and you can see uh, on this slide the most uh, significant uh, points uh, relating to services. Uh, it's like a free market access, and um, uh, here are restrictions from Ukrainian side. Uh, what is more important that uh, the agreement provides um, certain preferences for uh, natural persons, for employees of the companies uh, who provide services uh, and originate from other one of their countries. EFT or Ukraine, and there should be some simplification of access to the territory and to the work permit. Um, but uh, those FT provisions uh, are not implemented, at least in Ukrainian legisla legislation right now. We have different uh, terms uh, for work permit and prolongation. You see they are much shorter than provided in uh, FT provisions. So this is where the room of uh, development exists. This is a short uh, overview of the work permit uh, obtaining pr proce procedure in Ukraine. So if you're interested, you will see the basic things, uh, terms. Uh, for IT specialists, for IT business, you should know that you have a special preference uh, in Ukraine, Ukrainian legislation, uh, shorter term. Investments. Um, we have a number of uh, legisla legislative acts in Ukraine which provide uh, the system of uh, investment uh, protection. Uh, here is only the few of them. Uh, a number of international um, treaties and uh, agreements uh, where the Ukraine is party. Um, 
and uh, we also have a bilateral agreement with Switzerland on investment protection and uh, we have a bilateral agreement on in trade, business and economics between Ukraine and Norway. Uh, in Ukraine we have a state ag special state agency which is devoted to investment. Uh, you see there is a link to their website. Um, this is where the investment projects should be registered and this is agency which should provide information to the potential investors and uh, the action plan and etc so you can uh, you can go to this link and get acquainted more with their activity uh, in investment area we have recent changes as well mm, a new law on protection of investors was adopted very recently it provides for uh, new gar guarantees in this area, so you will see this, uh, them on these slides, uh, which is, I think, very important for the companies operating in Ukraine. Um, treatment principles uh, to the investment climate. Uh, uh, important thing, the land related issues. Uh, you know that uh, we have a uh, reservation of uh, gar Ukrainian government in the agreement and generally the, um, uh, that uh, foreign citizens and, and uh, are not entitled to acquire ownership of land and uh, other restrictions in this regard. But I should say that now we have a big wave of uh, changing in this regard. So we have a um, separate project uh, within the Ministry of Agriculture and also Ministry of Economy. Uh, today, Easy Business uh, Project uh, represents the idea of uh, reforming uh, so that the privatization uh, was um, uh, possible. A separate uh, section of the agreement is devoted to IP protection. Uh, generally, um, it provides for uh, certain guarantees which are not envisaged in Ukrainian legislation yet, so uh, these uh, provisions should be implemented in Ukraine. Um, but generally, in IP area, we also have reforming right now uh, in the process of harmonization with the EU legislation. Uh, we have draft law in, on investment protection in IT area. I know a lot of uh, our uh, delegates are from IT sector, so uh, this is the draft law which you have to pay your attention on and maybe to support it uh, within the organizations. Um, and uh, industrial designs also uh, will be improved through the relevant draft law. Um, government pr uh, procurement or public procurements. Uh, the separate section is devoted to this topic uh, in the agreement uh, and uh, it has, uh, agreement itself also has uh, different uh, provisions than they are in Ukrainian legislation. So this is where the Ukraine should also um, uh, bring it in line with uh, EFTA agreement. Uh, and there are several guarantees, very important guarantees uh, within the FTA agreement about public procurements, that there should be a national uh, regime uh, for, uh, for foreign companies uh, participating in the public procurements of Ukraine, as well as uh, a most favored nation regime should be also introduced. Uh, so th this is very important guarantees which should be followed by, uh, by both parties of the, of the agreement. Um, just uh, two days ago, I uh, talked to uh, one of my colleagues who is now, uh, who is now uh, responsible for reforming in public procurements within the Ministry of Economy, and that's what he told me they are uh, doing right now. Uh, first, they are introducing uh, very actively electronic system in public procur procurements in Ukraine. Now they are testing uh, the first version of the system uh, for Ministry of Defense um, uh, procurements. Uh, it's called Prazoro. Uh, after the successful testing of the system on this ministry, it will be uh, split to other uh, agencies. Um, then they also intend to simplify the procedures. And f uh, with this aim, they introduce uh, in changes into the legislation. Um, uh, they are conducting a special program on raising competence of the uh, government uh, government uh, procurement uh, organization uh, along the Ukraine, including re at regional le level. Uh, 
uh, few of their in, a few of their initiatives uh, refer to centralization of procurement, uh, and uh, they also unify Ukrainian standards with the European one. Um, if talking about all this, uh, having analyzed all these uh, provisions of the EFTA agreement and the current situation with the Ukrainian legislation, uh, I can state that uh, there are several legal constraints on implementation of the EFTA agreement. So the, as we say, lawyers say uh, that the devil is always in details. Uh, so the agreement itself is very nice. Of course, a lot of guarantees, a lot of provisions which uh, provide uh, security and trade, um, infor trade enforcement, but uh, uh, there are several uh, things that should be improved. The first one, those direct rules which are provided by the EFT agreement, uh, for example, those uh, uh, which refer to public procurement, to IP, to natural persons movement, direct rules with direct concrete uh, terms, conditions, etc., they should be implemented somehow in Ukrainian legislation. So you just can't go with them uh, to Ukrainian court and enforce them to the Ukrainian uh, court system. Because Ukraine, in practice, Ukrainian courts will not take this as a basis. So uh, we have Ukrainian local procedures, Ukrainian local laws, which establish this uh, procedural uh, system of uh, public procurements. And uh, of course, the uh, public, uh, public procurements organizations uh, which procure uh, for state funds, they first of all use this local legislation. They're not aware of the uh, international treaties and obligations under them. So uh, I think that the committee, which will, I hope, sit this year, uh, should think on the way of implementation of these direct rules. The second um, type of direct rules, which in my opinion could be implemented uh, directly, uh, refer to uh, specific orders of subsidies application, uh, certain uh, additional restraints on, um, uh, on, on uh, general or bilateral safeguard measures application. This, is should be, this could be done through negotiations, for example. This is more like easy to implement directly, but still the question also refers to these rules as well. Um, for certain provisions of the agreement, uh, there should be in place additional implementation measures. Uh, for example, uh, to uh, promote to promote uh, ser um, trading in services between the countries, uh, the, agree the agreement provides for uh, uh, recognition of certificates, dif different licenses, uh, which are issued in one country by another country, by Ukraine, for example. But uh, this provision doesn't uh, is not implemented because uh, the there should be. A uh, additional agreements, bilateral agreements on joint recognition in place. So exactly uh, this, is, this is one more instrument which should be uh, done and, uh, and agreed and uh, discussed at, at the nearest sitting. Um, for, for example, for, the, uh, for those um, uh, rules of origin implementation, which belong not only to Ukraine and TFTA agreement, uh, FTA countries, but also to EU countries and uh, uh, Balk uh, Balkan countries, uh, there should be additional also regional agreements uh, made, uh, concluded. So this is also have to be uh, made separately. Uh, now I would like to talk a little bit uh, about occupied territories in Ukraine. I, uh, I understand that this is a very important topic for the business and uh, business operating in Ukraine have, has to understand how to deal with these territories. Uh, first of all, um, if talking about Crimea, we have to understand that uh, by, um, by fact, this territory already is controlled by Russian Federation. Uh, so this is not the hot uh, ter ter territory in terms of uh, military conflict, uh, whatever. So just a, a territory which is not controlled by Ukrainian government. At the same time, uh, on the eastern part, we have a military tension, uh, which is uh, driven by uh, Russian uh, military support. 
And uh, there is such a perception outside, outside of Ukraine that all Ukraine is uh, uh, engaged in a military conflict, is everywhere tanks, etc., etc. It's not the case. So you can see on the, ma on the, on the map of uh, Ukraine, uh, the territory which is um, actually engaged in conflict is uh, quite small in comparison to all territory of Ukraine. Uh, so if you come to Kyiv, you will see absolutely uh, absolutely uh, normal life, uh, safe and uh, for business as well. Uh, and this territory of um, so-called ATO, ATO uh, anti-terrorist uh, anti -terrorist operation uh, zone uh, is very localized right now. Um, if talking about legal uh, status of this territory, Crimea is recognized by Ukraine as a temporarily occupied territory and uh, uh, recently a free economic zone has been established there with certain rules of operation, economic operation on this territory. So that means that um, Ukraine recognizes opportunity for business to operate in Crimea region, uh, but considering certain restrictions and conditions, of course. East of Ukraine is uh, a so-called zone of anti-terrorist operation. Uh, it's also recognized as a temporarily occupied territory by uh, these armed forces. Um, and um, currently Ukraine requested for deployment of international peacemaking operation in the eastern of Ukraine. So we do hope that uh, <coughs> the Norwegian uh, government will also support uh, this uh, request of Ukraine. Uh, referring to Crimea, um, the legal status uh, which has been established by Ukraine says that the uh, Russian Federation is totally liable for all breaches of uh, human rights in Crimea. So Ukraine recognizes that it doesn't control the territory, so all the uh, human beings rights issues should be transferred to Russian uh, responsibility. Um, Social protection of Ukrainian citizens in Crimea has a special procedure established by law. Uh, all Crimean courts were relocated to mainland of Ukraine. Um, Non-Ukrainian authority, uh, authorities are recognized to be illegal uh, in Crimea, and all their decisions and acts uh, are void for Ukraine according to Ukrainian law. So the, you, the business operating uh, on this territory should understand this, uh, the consequences of this uh, provision. Uh, entrance to Crimea and uh, exit uh, from, from Crimea is uh, permitted only through the check, special checkpoints, so a kind of border uh, border, um, borders have been established, in fact, and a certain procedure on, uh, on uh, passing through these borders. Uh, we have a number of sanctions, international sanctions against, against Crimea um, uh, from uh, both international organizations and uh, particular countries. You see that uh, Norway and Switzerland uh, have their special uh, uh, sanctions applied, applied against this territory. <laughs> Um, types of sanctions are as follows. They ban import of goods originating from Crimea, and there are some sectoral sanctions, which we'll, I will uh, talk a little bit later. Uh, restricted operations are like prohibition of import of goods originating from Crimea to Norway, and uh, prohibition of provision of uh, direct and indirect finances for uh, import of mentioned goods to Norway. Uh, there are certain exceptions. Uh, those goods which have a uh, certificate of origins issued by Ukrainian authorities, and we have already the cases of this, uh, are allowed for export-import operations. Uh, and um, if you have a pending contract which has been made before the sanctions uh, entered into force, you can um, finish, uh, finish uh, operations under the contract. Uh, here are the sectorial uh, sanctions. Uh, you see the areas and sectors where they are applied uh, and the restricted operations. Uh, we have um, certain uh, procedures established by this uh, law on free economic zone Crimea. Um, so uh, this is just uh, once again to stress that uh, the Ukrainian government recognizes uh, opportunity to uh, have business operation in Crimea. 
And a uh, few of our clients, for example, they continue performing these operations, of course, in, of course, in compliance with Ukrainian regulations. Um, banking regulation in Crimea is the most difficult for a business to, to cope with because uh, no correspondent relations, no uh, official operations by Ukrainian uh, banks. Um, so those business who decided for them to continue working in Crimea, uh, they come across with duality of jurisdictions, two jurisdictions, Ukrainian and Russian. So they have to keep in mind always uh, not only Ukrainian law, but Russian law, which in fact acts there. And uh, for example, if it goes about uh, the packaging of the product, so you have to comply with both jurisdictions. Uh, when making this import export operations you have to also follow a special uh, import regime or customs regime uh, for this territory uh, as regards uh, eastern part of ukraine uh, the legal status uh, recently there was uh, introduced a special procedure on uh, uh, entrance to this uh, territory so uh, a special permit, you, you need to have a special permit to go to this part of the Ukraine. Um, and um, because of uh, some, some business, some companies appeared at those territory with their manufacturing facilities and business operations, some of them, if they comply with certain new obligations, uh, new uh, um, conditions or established by Ukrainian law, they can continue working on this uh, territory. But there is a very limited list of those companies. They are by names introduced there, and they can uh, continue working on this. Um, I will not s say a lot of about uh, this agriculture agreements. I, I guess Dmitry will uh, stop on this uh, also, uh, promoting agricultural um, um, trade between the countries. Uh, I only said that there are three agreements made uh, in addition to the EFT agreement, and they constitute an integral part of the agreement. Um, what uh, should be done from the perspective uh, of, uh, from our perspective, is that also this agreement should be reviewed at the nearest um, sitting, and uh, maybe more preferential customs duty should be introduced. Um, to sum it up, uh, we as lawyers uh, can say that uh, the, DFT, uh, the EFT agreement uh, requires a uh, review of its provision as soon as possible. And uh, this year, according to you, the agreement, there should be this sitting of joint committee. And we hope that the relevant negotiations will take place. And um, uh, certain subcommittees should be established as well, because the joint committee is like an upper, upper level uh, body. Uh, which should decide on the, the main issues, but uh, the particular mis issues, for example, uh, which belong to sanitary measures, uh, to, uh, to particular industries, they should be regulated at the uh, level, level of subcommittees. Uh, so I think that uh, the joint committee should think on uh, the number of subcommittees to be established. Um, and uh, what is really lacking is a unified information resource where we can uh, get more information about uh, the movement of the EFTA agreement, implementation process, who is in charge of what, uh, which sectors are in focus, and whom to apply, and you know where business should uh, consult with. Uh, the last slides of my presentation show that uh, as a matter of situation in Ukraine and uh, the trading and uh, political relationship with the CIS countries and Russia Federa Russian Federation. The share of export-import operation with the Russian Federation reduced sig significantly. And uh, European uh, Union has uh, taken this share or is, is taking this share uh, uh, currently. So you see the share of European of the goods, uh, the share of export import operation of the European Union uh, is being increased, and we hope that it will be increased not because of the losing Russian share, but also because of increasing of the uh, turnover.
um, you can see here uh, also that uh, the same the same picture, and here are also the figures uh, of WTO uh, in for 2014. So the, we hope that this trend will be uh, more significant, uh, and uh, uh, it will uh, it will actually show that the European Union, the European country countries uh, support not only politically but also economically Ukraine. Uh, the last slide and logo is that every time has specific opportunities and uh, even in such difficult times uh, <coughs> a lot of business uh, come to Ukraine or operate in Ukraine they find uh, particular opportunities for them because uh, you know the shares of business are changing the industries are changing uh, banking sector for example etc so um, if if the business uh, thinks how they can use these opportunities, they can not only support Ukraine, but also gain profit from this situation. Thank you very much, and I'm welcoming your questions. Thank, thank you, Elena. That was uh, impressive, a lot of information. Uh, I don't think we have time for any questions, but the, um, for those who didn't get anything, everything that was on the, on the slides, we. Uh, we will put this on our internet uh, or web pages so you can look it up there and go through it and we can definitely discuss this with Anna both in the break and on the meeting session after the meeting. Yeah, please, so, please, please. Um, and I think, uh, Andre, you put this on on the open web page, do you? Yeah. So you will find it on the nucc.no. And you will also find a video of her presentation on the same side. On the TV channel, uh, on, uh, on YouTube. On the TV, on, yes. on, on, on YouTube. YouTube. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you, Anna. The next, next presentation it comes from our Norwegian law firm partner, Nick Wernerheim, who is also our host here today. He will talk about this agreement from the Norwegian legal side. So, Katie, please. Thank you. Is this on? <laughs> Everybody can hear? That's great. <coughs> Let's see if I can sneak in. I need to find, I have another presentation on one that's on there, so I just need to get it in. To the machine. Pointer as well, yes, yes. Great. Okay. So, uh, first of all, welcome again to uh, to us. Uh, very good to have you here. And it's also a good tradition. We've hosted this event now a few times. Uh, Victor Ryan is a founding member, I would say, of the of the NUCC, and and I've been on the on the board myself now since since the start. Um, now. Sigmund, you were almost right. I'm not going to talk about the EFTA agreement because that's been covered in uh, in depth already. Uh, so what I will try to talk about a little bit is the agreement uh, with the EU. Uh, and uh, that has some impact on uh, Norwegian businesses, obviously, uh, which we will come to at the end. Also provides uh, some input to the general situation uh, uh, between, between uh, uh, Ukraine and some of its main trading partners. <coughs> so, um, this is of course, um, let's see, we can, here we go, um, the Ukrainian-European Free Trade Agreement is a part of the General Association Agreement, which of course is the agreement that we should say almost triggered the situation that we have in the Ukraine today, which was the main focus for uh, the political uh, strains that, that arose uh, late 2013. 
uh, and the association agreement uh, was, as we know, then put on hold, but was then signed uh, February last year. Um, and the political, uh, uh, sorry, was signed after Mr. Yanukovych left, left office in, uh, and the country in, in February last year. Uh, the pol political part of it was signed in, uh, in, um, in March uh, last year and the economic provisions uh, in June uh, 2014. This is an extremely broad association agreement. Uh, somebody has to call it a quasi-EEA agreement or a mini-EEA agreement uh, because it provides for cooperation and convergence on a broad number of areas, uh, economic policy, legislation, regulation, um, uh, rights of workers, uh, and numerous other uh, topics. Uh, it moves towards free movement of people, which is, uh, of course, a, 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 an important part of the EU concept. Uh, and would also be a, a new thing for, 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 for Ukraine. Um, it, uh, of course, then also uh, has important elements uh, dealing with modernization of energy infrastructure, which is very important for Europe, the, the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Um, and uh, as we say, uh, it uh, uh, contains elements of what we today in Norway know very well as the EA agreement, but also other important parts of the EU uh, cooperation that we have uh, through Schengen uh, and other uh, bilateral agreements. Um, so the uh, agreement entered into force provisionally in November 2014, but as we shall see, we have a way to go before we have full implementation and entry into force. But, but the agreement is there, and it is the basis on which I believe everyone is now working, basically, in, 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 in Ukraine. Um, then moving on to the trade side, um, as we learned uh, through the previous presentations, the EU is the largest trading partner uh, of Ukraine, uh, more than a third of the trade uh, in uh, uh, 2013. And, and it's also, importantly, sorry, uh, the main source for foreign direct investment, which is also an important part of these agreements, which we'll come back to. Um, the <coughs> um, total EU imports in 2013 were 13.8 billion euros. Um, uh, so that was the trade from Ukraine to the EU. Um, and the trade the other way was 23.9 billion euros. So numbers that are a little bit larger than we can show in, in our part of the world. Um, uh, and it also demonstrates why this agreement is, of course, is a big priority uh, and it's important. Uh, the uh, Ukraine, as we know, is also a key transit hub for uh, gas imports to Western Europe. Uh, and that also reflects on why energy infrastructure, energy competition and these other elements of the energy market are important uh, for the EU-Ukraine relationship. So then moving on to the, to the free trade agreement which is called the Deep and Comprehensive, which is not a face mask or another cosmetic product, but uh, it is truly deep and comprehensive. It is uh, 350 pages. Uh, I must admit I have not read all of them, um, but it is, uh, it, is a, it is a very, very thorough, uh, wide-ranging agreement on, on free trade. It is not very different in concept and, and construction from what we have seen in the EFTA agreement, but it covers much more than the traditional tariff and duty issues. Um, the purpose of the agreement is to basically establish a free trade area uh, uh, between the EU Ukraine and the EU uh, uh, over a transitional period of uh, maximum 10 years. Uh, of course, an important part is always the opening of the markets through removal of custom tariffs uh, and, and quotas, but then also the very important part from the EU and the Ukrainian side is to get the harmonization of the Ukrainian legislation um, and systems to the EU, as we have done in Norway through the EA agreement. <coughs> the um, entry into force, uh, as was mentioned, uh, is 1st January next year. Uh, it has been postponed due to, uh, 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 to obvious political reasons that, uh, that need to be uh, dealt with, uh, but uh, hopefully that then will, will mean that it, it, it can enter into force 1st uh, January next year. Um, uh, and then start to, to, uh, to take effect. The uh, central features of the free trade agreement are uh, a reduction of tariffs. Uh, and as we learned from, I think, Arnfinn's slide, that 
it's close to zero uh, on a number of important uh, categories of goods. Uh, I think the EU itself says it's 98 to 99 percent reductions in, in tariffs. Uh, it represents a saving on the Ukrainian side, uh, as it was at the time at least. Uh, now this will of course depend on export volumes, but uh, close to half a million, half a billion, sorry, euros, uh, and a little bit lower on the uh, European side. Um, there are transitional measures. The car industry is mentioned as one of them. There are several other transitional measures. So again, this will take years to get to final fruition, but, uh, but this is the, 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 the ambition and this is the, the, the journey that has been started. Uh, equally important is establishment, trading services and electronic commerce. And here again, the goal of the agreement is to establish basically a free market. Uh, so also within services, uh, there's going to be free trade as we have seen from the Norwegian or the EFTA agreement and also freedom of establishment. Uh, so establishing businesses both ways is going to open up um, and, and that would of course mean a, a significant step. Um, uh, forward uh, for for I think both both sides here. Increased transparency, legal certainty is of course important to facilitate cross-border investment and that's a part of the agreement. This will necessitate national legislation which you have Lana mentioned uh, and which we will come back to. There is no automatic implementation here. There needs to be national legislation to follow up. Um, but if it is followed up it will establish a robust uh, basis for foreign investment. Uh, and then also harmonization with, as I said, EU rules and regulations on a vast number of areas. Uh, very important in the EU traditionally has been competition and public procurement, where procedures uh, have been established and hopefully the Ukraine will align to that. Uh, and we've seen that there are legislative initiatives already coming uh, on that area. Uh, and a certain other uh, topics that I mentioned there at the bottom. Then um, an important factor uh, also is cooperation on various, let's say, more technical issues. But these are the technical trade, uh, 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 or the technical issues that, that are uh, slowing down or preventing trade. Uh, they also need to be resolved. This is always a very important part of, the, of, of any free trade arrangement. And this is also comprehensively covered in the, in the agreement. Um, so, uh, so this should help in, in, uh, in uh, facilitating day-to-day -day trade. Dispute resolution, <coughs> from a lawyer's perspective, that's when the fund starts, uh, and hopefully the fund stops for the rest of you. Um, but uh, a very important feature, not necessarily because you need to use it, but as a uh, framework uh, to make people behave. Um, now, what this agreement does not do is to establish the type of supranational uh, bodies or authorities that we have in the EEA, where we have an EEA court which actually has legislative power or sorry, judicial powers over uh, individuals in the participating nations. So we will not have such a system yet, at least between the Ukraine and EU. Um, there will have to be breaches of the agreement need to be brought up by the states. They need to arbitrate them, but they can do that and they will have signed up to a binding agreement to respect uh, uh, an arbitration decision. Um, <coughs> this is very much based on the WTO model, uh, but they say that it's going to be a faster procedure. Now, uh, fast is a uh, relative term in any type of international arbitration, but uh, that's, the, that's the idea. So this is a significant part of it, but it also is a significant difference from what we have in the EEA and, and, and also internally in, in the EU. There are other important agreements surrounding uh, or in addition to the uh, free trade agreement and the association agreement. The energy community is of course key uh, where uh, Ukraine is part of the, the, the energy community and must therefore adopt uh, EU legislation in the energy area. Uh, Ukraine is a WTO member since 2008 as we have learned before. Uh, the WTO has an extensive uh, agreement uh, and framework as well. Uh, I'd also mention NATO because that is a part of the, let's say, orientation or reorientation that is going on. And that's, of course, uh, even more politically sensitive, um, but there are uh, a long-standing uh, relationship actually between Ukraine and, and NATO, uh, and we'll see how that uh, develops. So what does this mean for Norwegian businesses? Now, Norway is not a part 
uh, of the EU, so we are not party to the EU-Ukraine agreement as such, but we are indirectly benefiting from it through our association with the EU through the EA agreement. Um, and I will come back to the more of the, some of the effects that we can see, uh, or hopefully we'll see, um, uh, from, from a Norwegian perspective. But we, of course, have an extensive agreement uh, ourselves through the EFTA agreement. Um, we have the WTO framework, uh, as mentioned. We have the agriculture agreement that we've heard about. Um, and not least, uh, Norwegian businesses with EU-based subsidiaries will directly be able to benefit from the uh, EU-Ukraine agreement. Um, so there, there we've heard about some of these bilateral or EFTA uh, Ukraine uh, issues that are important for us and where we actually are ahead of the EU. We have already approved, implemented and started using our, our agreements. Um, and we will uh, be able to indirectly benefit uh, to the extent that uh, our businesses can trade through the EU or are established already in the EU. Then there are some additional effects uh, that we're coming back to. Um, So what uh, does this mean of possibilities for, um, for Norwegian business? Um, first of all, as we said, the EU-Ukraine and the EFTA-Ukraine agreement are very, have many common features and obje uh, objectives. Uh, all the harmonization efforts that will take place under the EU-Ukraine agreement will indirectly benefit uh, Norwegian businesses. Uh, it will harmonize uh, EU uh, or uh, Ukrainian legislation with with um, with uh, with, f with f uh, legislation that we are already a part of. Um, there are most favored nation clauses uh, in the EFTA Ukraine agreement that was mentioned partially. This means that if an improvement is made between the e Ukraine and the EU, we will directly benefit from it. Any tariff, any uh, change that is made. Well, I'm saying any. There are exceptions, but. As a broad rule, uh, tariff changes, for instance, or duty uh, reductions in the EU, uh, between the EU and Ukraine, will uh, have to be implemented also for the EFTA uh, countries. Uh, so here we will tag along uh, and, and, uh, and benefit from that. Obviously, the total effect of this arrangement is that we will hopefully have a better, safer, uh, more efficient trade uh, environment overall, so that will be good. Um, and as I said already, the subsidiaries uh, located or established in the EU will have a direct benefit. Then, of course, this will take a little more time, as we said, 1st January next year, and then an implementation period that will stretch a few years into the future, but uh, which would gradually uh, improve uh, the situation. So that's a, a broad and quick overview of what's going on between Ukraine and the EU in the trade area. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you. We are exactly on time now. Thank you. So uh, I think any questions to Kitty also have to. Right, we can take one, one question, but that's all. The rest have to wait for the mini. Please. Just one small question, a small one. When we expect the four free movements to be in operation? <laughs> I think I think uh, probably I'm not the best to, to comment on it. Maybe some from the Ukrainian side uh, will comment on it. But uh, uh, you know, we we uh, we certainly don't expect it to happen in, in within the next uh, in the next. I, uh, I'm saying a few years, but I, I can't give you a better estimation. I don't know if any of our Ukrainian colleagues uh, would, would would dare to to <laughs> to, <laughs> to get into it. Okay. So uh, I can't, I can't, give, I can't give, I can't questions. give you a, a, a very good answer. On that. There will also be the possibility to discuss these issues during the panel discussion mm -hmm. at the uh, at the end of the program. Um, we have one more. There you go. We have one more. 
issue on, on the agenda before the Just COVID break. Yeah. And that press secretary from the Norwegian, from the, from the Norwegian Embassy in Ukraine, Slitna, he will also, also talk about possi possibilities in from, the, um, from the Embassy in Kiev, I suppose. Thank yes, you. thank you, Sigmund. Does it work? Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you, dear friends, colleagues. Big thank you, first of all, for, uh, to Ansinger for make, taking the initiative, for uh, Nook for organizing it, and also to Victor Rein for hosting this event. It's very, it's very interesting. I'm also very glad to see there are so many people here. This reflects very well with the, so see, the amount of uh, interest we get from Norwegian and Ukrainian companies to, uh, to uh, the embassy. And also it reflects on the... Uh, as well as the, on the Norwegian-Ukrainian business forum that was uh, opened by Prime Minister Anna Solberg during her visits to Kiev in November, which was a huge success with the... I guess it was, if, as someone has told me, there was a lot more interest than was expected, so you could have had, uh, if we'd known about that before, we'd have a, a larger venue, as I understood. Um, as uh, Sigmund said, I've been asked to uh, say a few words on how the Norwegian government can stimulate more business between our countries. <laughs> there has been uh, already a lot of details about the EFTA agreement, about uh, such things, and there will be more speakers on it. So I will focus on a little bit more on the overarching themes and also give a brief description on the assistance that Norway is currently offering Ukraine. Our position First of all, on a political level, is uh, that Norway still remains dedicated to supporting uh, the UN, both was saying, the choices that uh, were expressed during uh, the revolution of dignity, the move towards uh, democratic society, with more freedom and a dignified way, way of life, to uh, also to Ukraine's reorientation towards Europe, and also, of course, to Ukraine's territorial integrity, which includes Crimea. Crimea is, as has been said many times before, a part of Ukraine. That's not up for discussion. <laughs> um, however, this is politics uh, and talks, but we do not only support Ukraine with words, we also do it with action. Uh, I mentioned Prime Minister Solberg's visit to Kiev in November, where she, among other things, uh, law, it, it marked also a launch of a comprehensive support package for Ukraine, which has entailed a s roughly sevenfold increase in Norwegian bilateral support to Ukraine, from a level of around 40 million kroners, as was originally planned for 2014, um, but ended up around 200 million or something. This year we might be looking at 300 million kroner. So I'll leave you to do the currency calculations. And that. Uh, that changes from day to day as well. Um, this, this includes budget support, which is um, it's, it's not really that relevant to trade in a degree, but it's, it's a move, so to say, to strengthen the solvency of Ukraine, to uh, make sure to make our small little benefit uh, contribution to the general macroeconomic stability of Ukraine. And this was chosen to be a grant instead of a loan, and, uh, which is meant also to... Well, it, it's, you, could, you could put it as a show of confidence, and uh, you can put it also that we felt that this was the best way uh, of stabilizing Ukraine in the short run. Uh, the plan was 100 million kroners in 2014, uh, 100 million kroners in 2015, and also the same amount for 2016. Uh, the uh, sum for 2014 has not yet been uh, dispersed. It is currently waiting uh, an, an IMF review, as far as I've understood it, but the plan is there, the money is there, and uh, as soon as the proper go-ahead from IMF and the World Bank is ready, the sums for 2000. 14 and 15 will be dispersed simultaneously. That is a 200 million kroner directly into uh, for the government. And those are funds that are to be used, so to speak, more or less uh, as the government sees fit in order to stabilize their finances. Um, and 
we'll we'll leave it at that since it's uh, not that relevant for uh, like further discussions. There's also humanitarian aid, given a little in uh, so around 30 million kroners in 2014. It will at least be the same amount, I believe, for 2015. But uh, the official announcement of it hasn't yet been made, so I can't go into any details. About that, the comprehensive package without has has three main themes or areas, accepting humanitarian and budget support. That is law and governments, it is energy, and it's European integration and trade. Now you may, so to speak, divide these into a lot of further uh, subsections, where the first one, law and governments, is the rule of law, it's good governments, it's democracy and human rights. A lot of things that the Norwegian side has been devoting time, energy and resources for uh, in Ukraine for a long, long time. Um, so also energy, that you should have probably it will be energy efficiency and reform of the energy sector. And or the European integration trade, that's trade facilitation, private sector development and EU integration. And this can probably be split down a lot more. These are like a thematic approach to uh, to systemize our way of doing this. Um, and you might say that although trade is only singled out in one of those areas with a European integration trade, it, it does not require that like, huge leaps of imagination to understand that all of these areas are relevant for trade between our two countries in, in general. Because corruption, where should we put it? Would that be under rule of law? Would that be trade facilitation? It's uh, that's a matter of definition, but it goes without saying, as has been mentioned before, that the battle against corruption will be a significant part of uh, the future of Ukraine and will determine the future of Ukraine to a very large amount. Um, but as, as I know, there are also other aspects of judicial uh, reform, so to speak. Um, but just to say a little bit about energy, mm, in that sphere, it's uh, to a large degree, as of yet, channeled through NEFCO, the Nordic uh, uh, finance me mechanism, so to speak, for environmental and energy efficiency uh, initiatives. They have done quite a lot of work already, as far as I understood from our, uh, our colleagues who work directly with that, it seems that those are progressing very well and they're also very active in the regions. So it's beyond Kiev and shows, shows a lot of attention outside, which is something that is getting to be more and more important for us, at least for us at the embassy, we see the need for um, people to see real change. Also, not just in the, ma in the ma larger cities, but also in the different regions. Um, since the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy and Petroleum isn't here. We could just announce that there also will be coming a delegation from the Ukrainian Ministry of Energy and uh, Coal Industries uh, to Oslo next week, supported by our uh, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Embassy. So there's a, there's a lot of movement also on the governance side as far as uh, as far as this is concerned. We do also have garden talks with NAFTA has about uh, helping them with uh, some reformation. And to that might add, a Norway might be interesting to the Ukrainian side uh, on a slightly different level than uh, the international organizations and the EU because we do have a little different setup as regards uh, how we govern our energy resources and uh, energy firms than, say, the ideal for the IMF would be a very liberalized uh, thing, whereas we have a lot of state involvement in our larger companies. So it's, uh, it, we have a di slightly different model, so um, we've understood from the Ukrainian side that this is an area of interest and see how our experiences with that. Uh, we were very pleased uh, to hear that Statoil went into uh, the agreement last year uh, with the Ukrainian side to deliver gas. Uh, this is, it's a very positive move. Again, we won't, uh, we haven't changed our traditional uh, policies in those area. They are based on commercial decisions and it's up to the companies in question to figure out whether it's interesting to invest in Ukraine as in other countries, but we are certainly positive of any such things and we will do our part to facilitate 
whatever good options come on the table. And uh, as far as what Nefco work, and also there are a lot of the applications we have uh, received in late uh, later stages are that we have a, we have a great focus on the future of a green economy for Ukraine, as this is of course very relevant in both agriculture, which we'll uh, get into, and also in the energy sector, because as is uh, one of the well-known quotes that we hear a lot about in Kiev is that if Ukraine had reached you know, the same level of energy efficiency as Poland, Ukraine would already be you know, an energy independent, independent country. And that just, you know, it's a very easy example, but it's something that shows, you know, there's a lot of potential in uh, different in energy efficiency areas, in biomass, in uh, different other green solutions for Ukraine. And we are certainly looking into that via different mechanisms, either projects or the many different funds that exist um, to see how and if it is possible to do something like that. Uh, as far as trade facilitation, as Jan Feuerberg has mentioned, the Bilateral Economic Commission was a very important step forward. And uh, as far as what Lan has spoken about, what Anfin has spoken about, whether there is, you know, is a need to revise that, I will leave up to uh, our other colleagues and we'll see what happens. But it's duly noted, and, uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. And also, as I expect will come from the Ministry of Agriculture, there is, uh, as well as what Jan Fagre said, there's a number of mm, well, requests from the Ukrainian side as well on veterinary and food safety issues, and there has also been a lot of movement on that side. And is, there's no doubt, really, that uh, there should be an uh, opportunity for increased, uh, increased trade in agricultural products from Ukraine. Um, and we'll see how that works. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the embassy, uh, is certainly positive in uh, facilitating any kind of contacts and doing, uh, doing our part in that. So uh, let's just take that in as an invitation from our side that we're always ready for any discussions. And as has already been mentioned, yes, there has been one visit from the Ministry of Agriculture, which was regards fisheries and food safety and more or less. And we'll see, also been talking with uh, the Chamber of Commerce on that and with, uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture in Ukraine about the possibility of having a uh, business delegation at some point for matchmaking. We would certainly facilitate with whatever we could do. Mm. And just to move on, I don't have a lot more time. As regards European integration and trade, as we have uh, mentioned and reminded ourselves, we are not a member of the EU, but as we are as tightly integrated as we are, we have a, quite a unique position to support Ukraine and to give some advice to share our experiences in integrating and harmonizing our rules and norms with, uh, with the EU. This is something we've brought up with the Ukrainian uh, government and uh, other authorities. We also brought it up with the EU. And we are looking into what we can do in that regard. We have some information. There are, for example, the, um, there, there exists a manual uh, on how bureaucrats, basically, how uh, should deal with EU manners, how, uh, how we should, you know, what, what does this mean for a person is, uh, who is uh, a certain regulation that comes in from uh, on the EU, which gets adopted into our laws? What does that mean for the um, one bureaucrat who is sitting in the working? How does that affect his or her everyday life? So um, this is a manual which is currently being revised after we had the talks with uh, the Ukrainian side because they uh, are people in a... European department at the ministry saw that there was a need to update a lot of some of the information, but we expect to share that with the Ukrainian side in the coming month or so is I think the time frame to be. So, so to sum that up, there's, um, ah, just to go about the regarding the EU integration, that is of course also very relevant for businesses because businesses also have to adopt to a new reality basically. 
One thing is the like the major major companies of Ukraine. They are working in a very international uh, environment, and basically have the expertise needed and already have the certificates needed to uh, to work globally. But this is not as true for the small and medium businesses who have to basically adopt to new environment. Okay, we're going to export to you uh, to Europe now more than we have had in different directions. What does that mean? How should we, how can we approach and get investors from the EU and from the EFTA countries? And so this is also something we're looking into locally and in cooperation with our in Kiev and cooperation with Brussels and the EU delegation in uh, in Kiev. So and we'll see, we're trying very hard to coordinate our efforts with the EU, with the different countries, uh, individual countries, to make sure that we, our money, our efforts are spent as efficiently as possible and that we try not to duplicate our, uh, our efforts because there is an enormous amount of interest towards Ukraine now. There is a lot of money that is potentially on the table but it's very and a lot of expertise from different countries, so it's very important that you know this gets used as to the best of its possibilities, and that we don't simply confuse and overload uh, the the ministries and other actors on the Ukrainian side, because that's uh, also to a certain point a uh, danger. When they get too much advice, it's difficult to see which is the best. Um, so. In addition to the work that's being done by our respective ministries in their respective uh, areas, uh, the way that Norway works with such issues also depends a great deal on other actors. So to that regard, there was a call for proposals for project op uh, applications, which had a deadline of March the 1st. I believe our colleg colleagues in the ministry who deal with that will have the answers for those calls, for those who are, I guess some people here might be involved uh, in such a, with such applications. The idea is that there should be a final decision this month. Um, this, the idea was to have it in March, however the interest was so great that I think we had applications totaling three times the amount that was already set out and so totaling some 600 million corners, so they do have a very difficult task of choosing the right projects and making sure that this all fits in a holistic package. Let's see. That's good. And, yeah. Um, there are a lot of things we haven't touched upon. We have education support, we have uh, some support for the regions, different programs. Um, so a little bit about dialogue, but since we've been focusing on trade here, I haven't uh, delved into those. But in short, Norway continues our long-standing uh, engagement in Ukraine, but we have increased our support massively, as it has been clear that it is now a completely new reality. There is, uh, as Lauren said, there's a new language, there's, you know, there's a, it's, it's like a totally different world, speaking with the authorities a uh, lot, so that's it's very good, and it is also, however, it is obvious that Ukraine has a lot of go, a long way to go. There is a need for reform, um, and yes, there is a conflict, but that is not a no excuse for not making the necessary reforms because that was what would otherwise be the point, so to speak. But when that being said, uh, it is the embassy's clear impression that there is a lot more going on than uh, the the, credit, the Ukrainian government has gotten credit for, and it's been under-communicated to a certain degree. I think Lana had a very good rundown of some of the some of the issues that have all actually been fixed and all been put into place. And there is a uh, support conference for Ukraine taking place in Kiev on the 28th, which our foreign minister, it seems, will uh, will attend. <coughs> And that is, as the plan goes, uh, it's a very good opportunity for the Ukrainian government to really show the results they have uh, achieved already and what concrete plans they have for the coming years, basically. Um, so we look forward to that very much. And just to conclude, on behalf of the embassy, I would like to say that we are, of course, available to assist in any which way uh, they are. 
we're always glad to hear from uh, businesses who wants to go into Ukraine. Sometimes you're, of course, not able to fully answer all of your questions, but we might point you in the right direction whenever possible. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, Next issue on the agenda is a coffee break. So um, we see you here in 15 minutes. Coffee and water, whatever, outside. And uh, the rest of it is over there as well. So see you in 15 minutes. Eh? There are expectations in what we can do. Could perhaps be easier if it was a full product instead of singling out the sum of the sort of the sort of the
А, ось тако. Ой, ну прикольно, звісно. Оце ви придумали. Давайте в місті ми станемо. Так прикольно. Секунду. Секундочку. О. Они себя тоже ассоциируют с 
производства всего в Украине. Это мы производим. Молока мы производим от мяса. Мясо мы производим. Я там на... Я там... И улетает с неба. Я на землю. Что вы производите? Но проблема еще в том, что где-то постановление какое-то нарисовали, зарегулировали, нужно пройти все органы этой И каждому нужно объяснить защиту. Каждый свидетель подозревает что-то там свое. Нужно в Минске Это треба робити, тому що це регуляція, там навіть нікому не нужна. Це там потенціал для корупції вивозить, але це теж. Система себе захищає. Десь люди помінялись, десь вже люди там європейські і з бізнесу, а десь ні. Десь чоловік сидить і говорить, а кому це тут? Держава.
Okay, okay. Could you please get seated? We have to get started. This one, yeah? Yep. We are already five minutes late. Before we start, Chief, would you like to say something? Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that the gentleman coming there is a very important uh, contact point for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the businesses. It's uh, Mr. Dimitri Pankrato, he's the business coordinator at the Norwegian Embassy in Kiev. So, if you haven't done so already, please have a few words with him. We can solve all the questions, yeah? yeah. <laughs> it has been a lot of talking about uh, agriculture. Now, as a principal from the Ministry of Agriculture in Norway, we'll talk about agriculture from the ministry side. Yes. Floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. There's been uh, a very good presentation so far, and I hope I can at least do my best. It's uh, Arnpin started this morning. Uh, well, first I was afraid he was going to take my presentation on agriculture, both with uh, nice pictures and, uh, and some facts about agriculture. And then afterwards, Jan uh, challenged me on uh, the customs duties for agriculture. Uh, having mentioned that, I think it's important to know that Norway, of course, ag uh, negotiates agreements as one government, not ministry by ministry. We go negotiate agreements together, and we also negotiate together with the other EFTA countries. Uh, just a brief overview of my presentation. There will, I'll try to not repeat what has been said before. But first, I will uh, give a very short introduction to Norwegian agriculture. Uh, for those of you that don't know too much about it, I promise I'm going to not say too much about it. <laughs> it's easy to care, be carried away. And uh, then I will talk about trade between Norway and Ukraine. Then look at agriculture in the U Ukraine EFTA free trade agreement. We already had some information on that. And then uh, I think grain and feeding stuffs has come up and is an important and a potential area for increased trade. So I'll touch upon that briefly. And then if you have time, do some questions and answers, or maybe we'll do that later today. Very briefly, I think you all recognize the country. Uh, there's a very limited area of uh, actually agricultural land, 3% of the country, and uh, most of the grain if you can say most, there's not much grain, but it's produced around the Oslo area in the east and some in the middle part of the country. Uh, grain field, fairly large in Norwegian standard, in Ukrainian standard, uh, a corner maybe. Uh, and uh, this is, as mentioned, the produced in this eastern part of the country. While you have milk and meat, which constitutes the main part of Norwegian agriculture, more in the valleys and on the west coast of Norway. Some basic figures on Norwegian agriculture. The number of farms have decreased quite substantially the last years. Only since uh, 2005 it has decreased by 18%. The land, agricultural land, has decreased somewhat. Uh, obviously the hectares per farm has increased to 22.6 in 2013, probably a little more now. Again, this is uh, minuscule compared to Ukrainian farm sizes. The milk production has increased uh, a little, while the amount of milk producers has drastically re been reduced to now a little less than 10,000. If you look at how the Norwegian agriculture, where they earn their money, so to say, or at least where they get the money from, it's one third from meat and one third from milk. And this is a very combined production where it's basically the same farmers that produce the milk that slaughter their animals. And uh, you see grain is 12% and then you have uh, some other income as well. That was just a short background. Then turn to the trade. Uh, in agriculture products, I think some have the view that there's a wall around Norway. We do not import agriculture goods. I think this uh, graph proves that that's not the fact. The imports have actually increased or doubled since 2005. 
Um, last year we imported 6 billion euros or 53 billion Norwegian kroner worth of agriculture products and the export is unfortunately not that great. The Norwegian production is mainly for the Norwegian market. Most of our imports come from the European Union. About two-thirds are from uh, neighboring countries uh, and or European countries. And uh, the imports are mainly uh, animal and fish feed, uh, protein, carbohydrates, beverages, processed agriculture products, fruits, oils, very important, both uh, fish and, uh, well, it's not uh, agriculture, but vegetable oils and then also normal vegetables and uh, plants and flowers. This graph might be a little complicated, <laughs> but it, uh, it shows uh, the very first, the top line is that uh, Norway is not self-sufficient when it comes to agriculture products. We import 55% of what we eat on a calorie basis, or rather we produce 45% ourselves. If we had eaten all the fish we export, we would have almost enough food. We would have up above 80%. Then we would eat a lot of fish. Uh, when it comes to dairy products, we're uh, almost self-sufficient. You have butter there. I think some of you might remember that we were not self-sufficient in butter a couple of years ago before Christmas. It was uh, a little unfortunate. Uh, there was not enough butter in the store, which is, of course, embarrassing for a developed country. Um, when it comes to meat and eggs, we're close to 100% self-sufficient. But then when you come below, you see the fruits and berries, a very small production, of course, mainly due to the, um, the climate. We have strawberries, raspberries, uh, apples, pears, uh, cherries. And, and a few more, but that's the, the core. And when it comes to vegetables, uh, we're also uh, importing quite substantial amounts. Of course, here it's also due to the climate and what we can produce and season, seasonal varieties in Norway as well. Potatoes, you can say we should have been able to produce more ourselves. It's a product that grows well, but uh, here also the imports have increased quite substantially. And then at the very bottom, you see grain, we're only grain as flour, uh, we're not self-sufficient by far. I'll, I'll come back to this. We have looked at quite a bit of statistics today in different graphs. This is uh, another one. This is the, Im the trade between Norway and Ukraine in agriculture products. Uh, you can see that imports is uh, above 100 million Norwegian kroner, while export is uh, fifth or 20 million approximately. It increased, has been increasing nicely. Um, I'm not sure the free trade agreement entered into force in 2012. Maybe that had an effect to the increase, we can hope at least. And then as the other statistics, unfortunately we have the dip now in, due, due to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, the main imports from Ukraine of agriculture product is by far um, sunflower seed oil and oil cakes and these are actually duty free but we can come back to this later uh, we also import walnuts uh, seeds in general blueberries honey and then uh, like sunflower oil is uh, input for the feed sector for for fish in particular and that's uh, i think that's uh, also great potential to increase imports for that sector Norway has a minimal export, but we export some swine meat, uh, some uh, processed products, soups, etc., and drinking water. Uh, just before turning more to agriculture in the EFTA trade agreement, just very briefly, the EFTA map, as we like to call it, how EFTA sees it. As you know, Norway is a part of European Free Trade Association. Uh, some people have called it SIMPA, the Stubborn Ignorant Mountain People Association, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not sure if that's uh, good or bad. The <laughs> it's uh, at least we're, we're still an organization. Um, currently, there are 25 trade agreements uh, negotiated through the EFTA network, covering 35 countries. 
I'm not going to mention all the countries, but it's quite a, quite a big network, and also to maintain all these agreements does take time. Uh, I can maybe just mention that ongoing negotiations are basically in Asia. We're currently negotiating with uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And we'll also start with Georgia in, in the fall. C you can see here uh, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan are green on the map because they were ongoing FTA negotiations, but they're obviously not uh, ongoing anymore. They, they halted uh, early last year. Okay, so then turning to the EFTA Ukraine trade agreement, Lana gave a very thorough and good explanation and presentation of that agreement. So I'm not going to mention all these different uh, areas. I think the main thing is that you have a chapter in the main agreement on trading goods, and then you also have the bilateral agriculture agreement, one between Norway and Ukraine, and also one Norway Iceland, Norway Switzerland. And uh, maybe what I could do, because uh, it was. Uh, People were asking for more information about this agreement. If you look at the EFTA Secretariat's webpage, it's a simple address, EFTA.int. You have all the agreements available and use. And you can look here at free trade. You have this map, and you also have all the free trade agreements. And uh, if you go to the bottom here, you have the agreement with Ukraine. General, a summary of the agreement. You have news, for instance, that they had the Joint Committee meeting, which uh, was mentioned that there's a Joint Committee meeting in uh, May 2013. So there is about time to have one. And you also have the content described and all the texts. And here you will also find the bilateral agriculture agreements. This is just to show you uh, practically where you can find the agreement if you want to look into it. I'm going to try to find the... So, what makes it a little challenging is that you have in the agreement, we have split agriculture into two parts. This is similar to what Norway has done with the European Union. In the EA agreement, we have a protocol with the EU on processed agriculture product, which actually are covered by the uh, framework of the EA agreement. So similarly, with Ukraine, there is uh, Annex in the main agreement, Annex 2, which is called Processed Agriculture Products. And uh, the coverage of this Annex is the same coverage as Norway has in its agreement with the European Union. And these are products as chocolate, bread, soups, biscuits. I understand Ukraine has very good chocolate, for instance. We, we claim to have good chocolate as well, but uh, we can, of course, trade. And uh, so this, these products, it's the same coverage as we have in the European Union. And what I think is rather good is that Ukraine is granted the exact same treatment into Norway for these products as Norway is giving to the European Union. There's even a clause if Norway renegotiates with the European Union, Ukraine will automatically get that beneficial treatment as well. This is uh, around uh, 200 products, and half of them, about half of them, are duty-free into Norway, and the rest has on average a 60% reduction in the duty. So this is a substantial preferential treatment into Norway compared to uh, other countries such as uh, that doesn't have an agreement with Norway, like US or Russia or yeah, other, other non-free trade partners. In general, the regime, you can say, is rather, can seem <laughs> from the outset challenging when you import these products. But the fact is that last year we imported around 11 billion worth of uh, processed products and the imports are increasing 10% every year. And, and there is a real uh, competition for the Norwegian uh, food processing industry in, in, in this, through this uh, regime. So that's the processed agriculture products in the main agreement. And then in addition, we have these bilateral, ag bilateral agreements, which was mentioned. This is uh, a separate document. However, it's stri strictly linked to the main agreement. You cannot terminate one agreement and not the other. They are, it's, just, it's basically the bilateral agreements, because Norway, Iceland, Switzerland do not have a common agriculture policy. 
So that's why we had bilateral agreements in, in this field. So in this agreement, you will find the two annexes, one with the concessions granted into Norway and one with the concessions granted into Ukraine. And there you can look through the list. And again, uh, I could click on the link, but I think you got the understanding from the previous uh, website. Uh, this was negotiated on a request offer process where both parties presented requests where they would like market access and uh, the other party tried to accommodate as good as possible, either through tariff elimination or reductions in the duties or certain quotas. And, and some products are also excluded from the agreement. Uh, examples of some concessions granted into Norway is a durum wheat quota, for instance, for, of 10,000 tons. 10,000 tons might not be so much for Ukraine, but uh, in Norwegian scale, it's at, at least a little more. <coughs> And we also have reduced duties or duty-free, for instance, for vegetable oils into Norway, which I think, uh, at least for certain, which I also think would be of interest, uh, such as sunflower oils and rape and canola oil. In general, we have a regime in Norway where imports that goes to, to animal feed has a duty, because uh, you want the Norwegian animals to eat Norwegian grass, in general, to say it very briefly, uh, while imports to human consumption is uh, m more often duty-free. And uh, what I will revert to, or I can... Uh, yeah, this uh, somewhat explains it. No. That we're not self-sufficient in grain and feeding stuffs in general in Norway. We produce some, I'll show, show a graph. But we import quite a bit of grain for human consumption. Of course, this depends on the, the crops in Norway and then the weather, basically, how much we need to import. We also import for gra grain and, uh, co and protein for animal feed. Both, uh, and I think at the main point, we import animal or sorry, grain and feeding stuff for aquaculture. And this is a substantial import. We, uh, for the human consumption of animal feed, we only import or we import around two million, two billion Norwegian kroner worth of uh, these products, while for the aquaculture, it's uh, around nine billion. So there's, there's a huge uh, market for feeding uh, fish in Norway with agriculture products. When you look at uh, this is a Norwegian production of grain and feeding stuff. It, it varies, of course, due to the season. It's somewhat declining. And it's all consumed in Norway. This is the imported quantities. Again, this is only for animal feed, not for the aquaculture sector. The imports are increasing. And uh, you see in 2013-14, the imported consumption was higher than the, what we produced ourselves. Then quickly to import of feeding stuff to aquaculture. The, the fish in which in the salmon, for instance, has almost become vegetarian. It's eating uh, 60 to 70 percent uh, vegetarian or vegetable input. And here you can see the diet. You see soy protein is the, the largest input. Then you have uh, wheat, gluten, sunflower meal. Uh, peas, bean, beans, uh, rape and canola oil. And of course, they also have some fish oil and, and fish meal. Uh, and I think so, quite a few of these products are of export interest to, to Ukraine. And again, all these are imported to Norway duty-free. Whenever a product is imported to, um, to fish, for fish feed, it's duty-free. The importer has to announce to the customs that this is uh, going to fish feed as end use, and uh, then you get it duty free into the country. So this is, um, that's for any country on an MFN basis. And, and that's, uh, as I said, mentioned a, a lar large market, market. And still increasing. At least if we talk to our fish experts, they would say that this will double or quadruple in, in some years. That's, uh, uh, maybe just, um, Briefly to summarize, uh, I think, and also as Arnfin mentioned, there is a potential for increased trade. Norway is a net importer of food by far. And Ukraine can also export to Norway based on the FTA Ukraine future agreement. There are some preferences there. 
You can also export to Norway within the import regime for grain and feeding stuff, as well to the aquaculture, which is, is the largest market, I think, for grain and um, seeds and oil, oil products. Um, of course, you can look at the agreement you have with the EU and compare. Uh, when you compare quantities, or you can't compare quantities, being that Norway is uh, less than 100th part of the EU. So I think you have to take that into account when you look at quantities and quotas EU has given and that Norway ha has granted, concessions Norway has granted. And of course, again, EU is a, large, a much larger market that can absorb imports from Ukraine to a different degree than, uh, than Norway. You, you could probably export grain to Norway 10 times our consumption. So that's, um, uh, and um, uh, Norway is also granting zero duty for quite a few vegetables and uh, or lower duties for vegetables and uh, fruits and berries, similar to the EU. Um, and, I mean, I heard a lot of people mention we should uh, renegotiate the trade agreement on agriculture. There, there is a clause in the agreement saying uh, uh, um, facilitating for further liberalization. And uh, this is something that uh, can be raised in the joint committee meeting, of course, and the parties can sit together and look. But this is, of course, a part of a larger renegotiation where you look at offensive, defensive interests for both parties sometimes including the other EFTA countries as well. And uh, historically, there has not been much success in renegotiating uh, trade agreements, to be honest. We are currently renegotiating with Israel and uh, with Southern Afri South Africa Customs, Customs Union. And the agreement with Israel is from 1992. And the agreement with uh, SACU is from 2008. And, and they, it, it's extremely cumbersome, but it is, of course, possible. So, so that is a track to look at uh, possible renegotiation, but I would strongly recommend to look at the current possibilities and uh, take into account the quantities and qualities Ukraine can provide. I think you have a great opportunity also under the existing regimes. However, I think uh, occasions like this, where you both get information and uh, connect people is extremely important. Uh, Sigburn was mentioning uh, ma possible matchmaking between exporters and importers and just to establish trade channels. Of, of course, that's not something the, the government cannot be in charge of that. That's something the traders, economic operators have to do. And I think it's important that it's done. And, and, and through that, you can establish uh, viable trade, trade flows, which I think there is a great potential for. I think that's uh, that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we can come back also to the question if uh, Colin during the panel discussion. So yeah. because we are a bit behind schedule. So I think we should go to the Ukrainian side to meet the Schumann Meister from uh, from the Agriculture Ministry in Ukraine and see what how they look at the situation. So to meet you, please. Hello everybody. Okay, I would like to introduce myself. Do you hear me well? Yeah. So Lana already did it, but I would like to repeat. Uh, my name is Dmitra Schulmeister, and my name is very close uh, to the previous uh, uh, person. So maybe we have some relatives behind. <laughs> uh, we need to check that. So uh, today is exactly one month when I'm in the position uh, of a uh, person who works in the ministry. Before that, I was working for business for more than 15 years. And I would like to share my experience and my feeling after becoming a state employer. Um, my first weeks of being employed by ministry, I have a feeling that I appeared myself on other planet, with other gravity, with other atmosphere. And I had to teach myself to breathe in another way. And uh, frankly speaking, I was really 
uh, impressed to realize that. And uh, now my goal is to make business and government to live on the same planet, to breathe the same atmosphere and to enjoy the same gravity. So far it is not like that and um, for sure it will take some time to come to this point. And I would like to say that now we have a lot of new people in ministries and we are doing our best in uh, deregulation processes. But the problem is that system is protecting itself and it takes a little bit more time than we expect and then population of Ukraine expecting from us to make this change. But for sure, uh, I've heard a lot that we need to communicate what is already done and we will do that and uh, a lot of deregulation processes is already going on. So uh, I would like to, of course it was uh, discussed a lot about FTA and after receiving information and communication with uh, participants of this event I realized that together we will change, we will uh, implement additional products in the FTA agreement and for sure automatically we will increase our cooperation, especially in agricultural segment that I'm the most interested in. Uh, you, you've seen these figures, but just to understand uh, that it is very obvious which products countries are specialized in. And for example, if we will look at FT countries, we see that big amount is fish so, and fish is core competence of Norway. We understand that. And we are looking at this segment very precisely, very attentively. And if we look in Ukraine, import from Ukraine, talking about agriculture, waste, do you agree that Ukraine is have key competence in waste? No way. Last year, Ukraine was number first exporter of uh, uh, sunflower oil globally. Number three exporter of corn. Number five or six, I don't remember exactly, exporter of uh, soybeans. So we are, not, we, we are not focusing on waste. And that's why I would like all of us to understand that Ukraine is agricultural country. And it was mentioned today that about 25-30% of uh, soil is located in Ukraine. And we need to use this. And uh, this is the only way how Ukraine will develop next years. And uh, this is the uh, sector that we need to improve and increase cooperation with Norway. And I'm absolutely sure that, especially after this meeting, we will find the way how to solve that. Uh, this again about ways, but I will not focus on that anymore. It was a lot discussed today. Uh, talking about figures, and I would like just to, to make a comparison of numbers that we were discussing today. So agricultural export in 2014 from Ukraine was 5.4 million US dollars. It's about 27% of our total export volume. But frankly speaking, when I've seen those figures, for me it's like close to zero from one side, but from another side, great opportunity to develop. And I would like all of us to understand that there is great opportunity for growth, for development and for increasing trade in different segments and especially in agriculture. So we discussed today that there is a possibility already this year to implement, uh, to change this FTA agreement and to implement additional products. It was very great for me to realize that for uh, fish feeding sector we can start already some actions right now and nothing to complain about Kazakhstan and Belarus but Ukraine is the country that chosen the way of democracy of European uh, vector and I, I, I'm sure that Europe and European countries need to support us in this uh, drive in this way and we really expect that. Fish I understand that for Norway fish is important and it was mentioned today by Lana that during last year Ukrainian currency dropped dramatically so the valuation was about 300 percent and all of us we need to understand that for uh, ordinary consumer all the imported products become much less affordable and in this way purchasing capacity decrease and we see immediately reaction of uh, export from uh, Norway to Ukraine of fish and other products that export decreased. And we already had some communication with fish agency in Ukraine that there are some ways how 
uh, our countries can be a little bit more flexible in terms of price policy of importing fish from Norway to Ukraine. There are some words that I've heard like Klondike and etc. that can be used and we can make a little bit softer this uh, devaluation process and we can make some products from Norway a little bit more affordable that we are interested in and I'm sure that uh, Norway is also interested in, in that. Fish. So uh, for me it's absolutely clear that uh, FTA will be uh, let's say negotiated and changed and we will have a chance to increase sales of our commodities products like grain, like corn, like soy to Norway. But we would like to think further and we would like to think about some added value products and some processing in Ukraine and we would like to think about export from Ukraine some products which is processed and in this way now we have some ideas internally that it can be a good idea of uh, uh, attracting Nor Norwegian investments and or some big investor into Ukraine to build Greenfield fish feed factory and uh, in this case we will have a lot of benefits both sides and of course we are talking about cost savings because even to bring some fish fish feed product from Ukraine to Norway or from other country will be much more efficient than to bring raw material. Secondly, the idea was that to have some plant somewhere in uh, eastern part of Europe which will produce high quality fish feed products. We can, we can I, I say we, combining Norway and Ukraine. So we can use this uh, facility as production and distribution center of our products uh, for Eastern Europe and Middle East. I absolutely agree that in next five, ten years aquaculture production will increase dramatically. It, is, it will be double or even triple growth because it's obvious that the world is developing in this direction. So this idea can be very nice investment implementation in Ukraine together with Norwegian experience, Norwegian investments and uh, uh, support from uh, Norwegian side. So we are talking about this uh, nice stuff that uh, fish like very much. And right now we already we see the growth of aquaculture production in uh, such countries which are very close to Ukraine and that we are communicating with. And I'm talking about Poland, Turkey, Georgia, Armenia, Greece. So those countries are <coughs> developing aquaculture production and we need to be in line with this segment which is growing. Forestry. Just last week uh, it was some legislation change in Ukraine in accordance with which Ukraine banned export of round wood. And we can expect why it was done and what uh, the benefits can be for companies which are very close in forestry and uh, in uh, wood processing. So we can expect that it can be some decrease of price of wood and as a result it, it will be much more favorable conditions for the development of forestry industry in Ukraine and also we can see some opportunities for Norwegian companies, wood processing companies to come to Ukraine to invest, to build some factories we, uh, and, and to build those factories in Ukraine but not in China because right now we see the situation that big business is focusing on Ukraine because some production and some cost of good produced more attractive to be produced in Ukraine than in China. That, that's why focus can be changed a little bit and we would like and we are uh, uh, explaining to some of our partners that it can be used as additional opportunity to develop Ukraine and to invest in Ukraine that we are very much favorable for. Shipbuilding projects. You can ask me what is uh, related to agriculture and shipbuilding uh, but uh, we can argue about that because right now, together with uh, Ministry of Infrastructure, our Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food are working on big project, and we call this project Open Rivers for Agricultural Logistic. And in this case, uh, there, uh, what we see that it will be great opportunity for shipbuilding pro projects in Ukraine, and Ukraine have enough not utilized shipbuilding yards that can be used for that because. If we will open our rivers for uh, agricultural logistics, we will definitely need a fleet for that. 
and our uh, shipyards can be used. And there is great experience behind in, behind in Norway that also can be used in these projects in Ukraine that I would like to inform and attract possible investors in Ukraine. And also what can be interest for Norway, if we will go further, and I, I already see how big amounts of our crops will go to Norway, including uh, fish feed and including human consumption. Using um, a river uh, logistics, we can be much more competitive because river logistics is twice cheaper than rail in Ukraine if we are talking about internal uh, log logistics. Educational cooperation, I know that it is already there, that we have already a lot of educational uh, programs and uh, I would like all of us to see on these programs and to perceive this not only as investment into Ukraine and or some grant to Ukraine. If you are talking about future investments in Ukraine that will come for sure from Norway, this educational program is building the base and is preparing the good ground for uh, the employees, possible employees who will be used by Norwegian companies in future and also using experience and sharing experience which can be used further on in future when more Norwegian investments will come to Ukraine that I'm sure will happen. So to focus on this is almost last slide that I would like to share just to repeat that we need to be focused on some projects and some ideas and uh, that we can put into practice together. And of course we need to add corn, rub, soy to uh, agreement. We need to think about further action about added value pr projects. And uh, it was mentioned today that big amount of soy protein is used for fish feeding. We have another project in, Ukraine, a project in Ukraine now about deep processing of soy. And talking about soy, we are positioning our soy production as GMO free and we are now in big discussion with different big companies how to uh, fulfill this uh, and how to confirm that Ukrainian production is green, is ecological and GMO free. And we would like to use this as unique sales proposition of the country in future in terms of uh, current uh, climate and current, current ecological situation. Forest, oops, sorry, forestry is opportunity and we know that uh, Norway have great experience in that. Education, opportunities is shipbuilding and for sure we need to create conditions for increasing export of fish from Norway because I'm consumer of Norwegian fish. I like it and I would like to have much more consumers on Norwegian fish in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you uh, Now we're going from food to investment, Ministry of Economy. Dennis Potenko is now wide. So where do we, where do the Norwegians invest in Ukraine? My name is Denis Gutenka. I'm recently appointed as the head of the Department of Foreign Economic Activity in Ministry of, of Economy of Ukraine. So, uh, the, the same One moment. So, 
as the previous speaker said, I'm from business too. I, uh, I'm working in, in the ministry for two months. I'm from business too. And uh, especially last year, I used to work in agricultural sphere in Ukraine. So the first, um, in the ministry, we are focused, uh, focused on uh, deregulation as uh, <coughs> so our, our task is to help business to feel free in Ukraine uh, and um, what was done so far I in deregulation is uh, we cancelled 26 licenses 16 regulatory uh, regulatory limitations and uh, we are harmonizing certificates and uh, expertises with the EU standards. <coughs> so we are uh, now, we have a group who is uh, working on state-owned enterprises. So we establish a new competitive procedure of CEO appointment and uh, we have now many ongoing uh, competition and we collect in a CVs from business um so, so far we have only <coughs> uh, just uh, one appointment of one state bank uh, and we establish obligatory publishing of financial accounts and other key information of these entities in the ministry we have <coughs> now 1300 employees and uh, uh, we decide to reduce this amount <coughs> by 50%. So 30% of staff reduction is going now, and 20% uh, we, we will fire till the end of the end. So we provide zero tolerance to corruption, and uh, all new people who come to our ministry is, uh, are from business, all of them are so-called volunteers because they don't uh, get anything from this work. It's only um, patriarchal feelings. Uh, what we do with public purchases, we have almost all new people there. Uh, they establish in, uh, new electronic procurements. They have uh, already one um, experiment in Ministry of Defense with these electronic procurements. Uh, this procurements provides um, economy of at least 20% of money. And uh, they're preparing for GPA sign. <coughs> so we're, we're working on anti-corruption reforms. Uh, government is establishing a new anti-corruption bureau and agency. So we're working on uh, electronic venture fund system, as uh, and uh, as our exporters said, this uh, system now works quite good. Uh, we um, uh, deal with oil and gas auctions, and we remove uh, 15 discount uh, uh, from it. So before. Uh, on the auctions, <coughs> some people, which we know, get this discount discounts. And uh, one of the success stories was abolishing Ukraine resource monopoly. It's in Ukraine; everybody knows it. So next steps: we want to cancel 180 more regulatory limitations, launching guillotine for public regulatory agencies. <coughs> That means that every agency should prove uh, the need of their existence. So if they prove, they will stay. Otherwise, uh, we will dismiss them. Uh, and uh, big work uh, <coughs> in uh, COE in, uh, enterprises. Uh, we are <coughs> looking for people who will be new CEOs in that our uh, state enterprises. <coughs> In the end of April, we will conduct conference 
in support of Ukraine. And uh, the, in this year, we should uh, reform anti-monopoly committee. First of all, we will uh, uh, set the new uh, head of this monopoly, anti-monopoly committee, and uh, uh, we are working on reforming uh, legislation uh, of this committee. So um, this is what we do. And uh, now for investment, uh, the best opportunity is in agricultural sphere. But uh, agricultural sphere has more, m much more supportive spheres like machinery for agriculture, <coughs> producing um, fertilizers, etc. So localization of Import uh, those firms who just import products to Ukraine would get much more profit if they localize part of their production in Ukraine. And uh, all assets uh, due to due to the war, due to devaluation, are at the bottom now. They are so cheap that, uh, as we know, that people who would take this risk and invest in Ukraine now. Uh, they will get the most profit. So thank you very much. I will ask any questions. Thank you. Um, now, we will uh, hear as a written importer what kind of reaction does the Norwegian export, importer of agricultural product has to what he has heard so far and what he has learned earlier. So, um, we are very clear from the... We are very clear from the... We are talking about from the from import from Ukraine on, I suppose that's mainly grain. Yes, that's yeah. mainly grain. Okay. Yeah, I will just uh, start a little bit about uh, what kind of company we are and go uh, on to what kind of thing we are thinking about when we are importing uh, grains from uh, uh, other countries than we normally take the grain from. So uh, Norges Malai is owned uh, mainly by the farmers in Norway, uh, f and that's Talitjöp uh, AG. Uh, and uh, we are a company that's uh, owned by its uh, Sanova group, and we uh, uh, Norges Malai is the milling company in this uh, group. And we also have uh, uh, some uh, sister companies that's uh, mainly uh, making fresh bread to, uh, in Norway. It's uh, you have this uh, like uh, master barn. It's making all the bread for Ramatusen today, you know, fresh bread in the shops. And you have this uh, Norges Bakrine. It's making uh, a lot of bread for uh, Ica, and also for, uh, number two for Norges Gruppen and uh, and Coop, because they are situated all over Norway. So they are, that's that's the reason. So uh, we are make, uh, we are making most of the thing we are making is uh, flour is uh, from wheat. We are a meat mill, uh, and we are producing uh, uh, a lot of uh, of it. It's from the it's from uh, it's to uh, the bakeries and some uh, for the end users. So uh, we have a, a lot of transportation of uh, flour on the. Every day to the bakeries because it's you know you know it's very important to have fresh bread in the shops. So uh, ha here you have the figure of uh, food grain consumption in Norway in tons, and then you see the total is on uh, three three hundred twenty-seven thousand tons. It's uh, wheat is the biggest, uh, but the uh, thing is coming up. It's oat because of the health trend. It's more and more oats coming up. So uh, maybe ha we have to develop some uh, more products that uh, based on oats uh, the coming years and uh, combine that with, uh, with wheat. So 
So how uh, we are working uh, when we are thinking about importing things uh, to our uh, mills, we are importing uh, um, approximately la last year we was uh, taking in 70% uh, was from abroad because the, uh, it's depending on the summer and the weather. So then uh, if it's sunny, not raining, so much wind, then we are uh, buying it. Uh, most of it will we buy in Norway. We have to buy all the things that's been uh, having the right quality of a Norwegian crop. And then we are taking in the things that we need to get up to the quality that uh, our customer would like to have. <coughs> so we are uh, every year starting up in uh, the autumn, look for uh, t tests of, uh, of the Norwegian crop, uh, take it into the laboratory, going through it and uh, testing it, and we are finding how it is and how it's, uh, if you can bake with it. And then uh, we finally uh, get a solution, what kind of other grains we need. And then we are always uh, going to the normally Germany, Baltic, Russia, Poland and Kazakhstan and getting uh, samples of 10 uh, kilos, analyzing it, see if it's possible to use it together with the Norwegian. And then we are having this uh, micro mill that we are testing it and then we at the end we are test baking it in uh, small scales and find out what uh, country could we go to and um, add in with the uh, grains that we get the same quality as we had the year before. So, uh, so because like this uh, test baking, we are this is just with Norwegian, and this was how it just looks like. It's uh, because uh, we get complaints when it's not high enough because the a lot of the um, breads in Norway are uh, having a history because we got very high quality of grains from uh, Canada and US. And that's why we have uh, not the same uh, traditional way of baking uh, like in Sweden and Finland. So it's, uh, uh, that's why we are struggling to uh, getting the right uh, quality because uh, uh, the quality uh, that the uh, end consumers would like to have, uh, it's not, uh, the same as the quality as on the grain that we have in Norway, because we are having uh, some grains uh, in Norway, but that's uh, not in the quality that's, uh, that the end user would like to have. So it's uh, very important every year to find out what is our need, uh, and then find uh, things that we can use together with it. So it's, uh, that's uh, also challenging because of a lot of uh, um, brokers uh, like in Baltic they are some years we are buying a lot from them and the next day nothing because that's because we, uh, the quality is changing from year to year and that's uh, because the falling numbers and gluten and so on is different because of the uh, how much sun there's been and so on and if it's been raining during uh, the autumn and so on so it's uh, that's why for us it's important to also see on other markets to see if we can uh, having grains for other markets, because the the climate is doing that, it's uh, not so stable, and we can't just think that uh, we can always get a, the the right quality from Germany. Because like this year, the quality for Germany was going down, because we had a they had a very nice summer, but it was too hot for the grain, and then then we had of course then the, we had a good. Uh, summer in Norway as well, and then we uh, we um, saw it because the Norwegian crop was much better on quality than uh, the two years before. So we had a, a crop uh, last year was the best we have on uh, during the last ten years. So, uh, but normally we have to struggle to find a quality that fits into the uh, fits together with the Norwegian uh, grain. And uh, then I will also say s something about taxation. Uh, they have been saying it's lots with words today, but uh, how how it is uh, for us when we are selling this? Because it's four times a year they are coming up with the taxation, and then they are going out with what's the price in the Norwegian market? Uh, 
uh, and then they are going into uh, see what's the prices uh, on the world market and then we are <coughs> using this uh, uh, the quality of uh, German E that's elite uh, wheat with 14% protein that's quite high protein but it's uh, that's the thing that we would like to use and it's good to have into the way we are baking in Norway because uh, we are uh, f coming up to the average of the flowers we w w uh, our customer would like to have we have to have uh, wheat with a protein level uh, around 13.7 uh, in, uh, in uh, general so then we also they are taking and saying what's the price on uh, this uh, this like from 1st of March it, the, you're going to the Matif and then you see the premium of, of the Matif and then you get the price of what it costs to buy a German e-wheat uh, from Hamburg and then we also uh, adjust for uh, transportation from Germany to uh, uh, a point in Norway called Stavanger and then they adjust it for also the the currency at uh, just uh, that time so that's also we don't have to have this risk of uh, currency it's just we have just the risk of currency for three months and then we got this uh, um, tax uh, so it should be the price of the imported uh, goods and the Norwegian crop should be <laughs> more or less the same that's uh, the, the, the price level should be the same and then uh, uh, we go to why not grain from Ukraine of course uh, like when you focus on a thing you can see that may maybe we why we not are using been doing it so far I think it's a little bit about history like in our co uh, company we have been uh, been a history that we, we were testing 10 years ago we got a sample uh, of um, and they got in it was very good and uh, but the cargo that was coming was not the same quality and then uh, when you s and then it stops because we uh, we were struggling a lot just to get rid of them and putting into the products just to be because it was not the same product that we was expected and when you get in uh, 3000 tons of something you not at the level you would like to have and then you have a problem it's not just to get rid of it so uh, that's a little bit of the history but I think that's been also been changed you see a lot of uh, people from uh, EU company that's in uh, Ukraine coming up and I think it's been more into having this uh, um, quality one two and three standard on ABC or what you call it and then uh, I think uh, if it's very important to this 10 kilo is the same that you get when you then when the cargo is coming into uh, to the silo because then it's not so easy to get it out so uh, so I think uh, the challenging to for Ukraine is I think uh, is the logistics uh, because you are competing with like uh, the Baltics uh, I think uh, and also other countries uh, and uh, and we have to do something to get the uh, in position because uh, the price you get in the world market is better than to ship it uh, from uh, the Black Sea and then you get the same price at, so I don't think you have the it's too long from Norwegian in the but I think if you have the right quality in uh, like uh, some years we need this kind of quality then it's not so important with the logistic because we if you get a good crop in Ukraine and it's you don't get the same quality from uh, for example from Germany then I think uh, then it's something happening then it's not the price so important then it's just important to have the right quality to come up to the standard that uh, our customer would like to have so uh, in some ways if you it could help uh, if you you know unstable climate and uh, I think uh, Ukraine had the climate to be there I think uh, in the future it's uh, maybe you, it's not the problem uh, with the logistic but uh, you have to have the good logistics and also maybe to get uh, uh, an initiative to do something I think if you can have some uh, doing some with the lo uh, logistics or the taxation uh, reg uh, regarding uh, 
the grain from Ukraine. So um, I think if you can adjust this uh, kind of taxes in uh, some ways, like they, w they are u using uh, to do for Kazakhstan, because it's a uh, much longer distance to uh, transport the uh, grain from Kazakhstan, because like we, when we are, s we are buying some high quality wheat from Kazakhstan, so some could be bought uh, in the same way from um, Ukraine. Uh, with a reduction of just 20% of the taxes, it's then you can come all the way from Kazakhstan to the Baltic Sea, and uh, then you take it by uh, train. I think it's uh, it's not much you have to do with this kind of reduction before you get the sa um, better effect and you go into position that the uh, Norwegian would like to use uh, Ukraine uh, w uh, grains instead of from Kazakhstan. But also some years uh, and you, you are competing, but in some years you have uh, advantages, some other years disadvantages. It's come because of the weather and so on, so it's uh, not, uh, it's uh, depending on. But I think it's uh, having uh, having some reduction. It could be uh, be good. The same as we have it for the Durum. Uh, we have a uh, today we have from Cossacks, uh, for, from Canada and Ukraine uh, zero taxes. But uh, unfortunately, we are uh, it's uh, much easier to buy. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, product by Durum that's like a uh, pasta production and uh, then it's uh, a lot of uh, capacity in Italy and so on uh, so it's uh, it's not much uh, pasta production uh, in uh, Norway these days the most of it's uh, you, you take from uh, Italy uh, as finished product and then it's so may maybe it's going to be but to this year maybe we can take some from, from Ukraine because we are not buying anything from Canada this year because of the currency. Uh, it's not coming in uh, like Durham from uh, from Canada to uh, Europe because it's uh, too expensive. So uh, and then it's uh, I think it must be an op opening for for Durham, Durham for uh, high quality Durham uh, from uh, Ukraine into the European or, and also a little bit into the Norwegian markets. That's the thing I would like to say. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Now uh, we are leaving the authorities and the businesses and listening to the academia, aren't we, George? So. The president of Kiev School of Economics will present his view on the potential. You would like to use this one? Yes. He, he will also be managing the uh, the session afterwards. So I leave it to the session. Uh, let's see. Might be easier just to stand up here. Um, I was asked to speak on three different issues. So I'll address each one of them. And um, I had prepared a nice presentation, but everybody ruined my presentation by saying everything that I wanted to say. Uh, so I, uh, I desperately have to fill 20 minutes with something that adds value, is additional, and so on. Um, let me say that uh, uh, unlike all the speakers here, I'm not Norwegian, uh, and I'm not Ukrainian. I hold a US passport. So I guess I'm the only objective person here uh, who, can, uh, who has no vested interest. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start with, uh, I, I was still taking notes, that wasn't quite ready. I'd like to start, start off with uh, the first of my uh, three topics, which is um, the uh, political outlook in Ukraine. Uh, and before I do that, I just want to say hello to, uh, and, and thank again, uh, the people from the ministries uh, of Ukraine. I've been in Ukraine since 1989 on and off, 1992 full time. And this is the first time I have ever seen young ministers and deputy ministers. Uh, that's it. I mean, this is a radical change which should send a strong signal to everyone in this room who's thinking of trade and investment in Ukraine. 
Ukraine today is a very, very, very different country from what it was like in 2004, uh, in 1990, and uh, 89 when I first came to Ukraine. Uh, I think Ukraine is coming to that final uh, takeoff stage where afterwards everything will go very, very well. Now, uh, you, you, can't, uh, you can't predict the future or talk about the future without taking a look at the past. In fact, there's this wonderful science of uh, econometrics which just, just does just that. It takes the past and prognosticates the future. Ragnar Frisch, uh, Nobel Prize winner of Norwegian economist, uh, was one of those who developed these very powerful techniques. Um, Ukraine's past uh, is, is a very interesting one. First of all, uh, I don't know whether to, to credit Norwegians or Swedes. Uh, I think there's some dispute between the two. You guys were the first uh, foreigners who came uh, into Ukraine and stayed. Uh, agreed? Norwegians probably, right? Uh, you know, that Viking spirit. Uh, and I think today is the opportunity for the Vikings uh, to make their stand again. Um, Ukraine was a rather uh, peaceful land uh, until uh, something went wrong in something called the Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, Ukraine got caught in a three-sided three war. Uh, and it's awful to be in a three-sided war. You've got Turks in the south and you've got Moscow, there was a Russia at that time, uh, in the northeast, uh, and you've got uh, Poles who were supposedly your allies in this commonwealth uh, in the west, uh, and it got very, very rough. And so Ukraine's first revolution was in uh, 1648, when it decided to kick out the Poles. Uh, unfortunately, they made a deal with the Russians, and for 350 years, that has been a problem. And I, that's the problem today. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine, and it's clearly an invasion, is just a continuation of a struggle for the last 350 years. Um, but I think it's getting resolved. Uh, I think that the sanctions, I think the threat, the, the threat of SWIFT, and so on, uh, has put uh, this momentum uh, to a stop. And I think in a future civilized world, this will never, never repeat. We just needed to have this KGB guy who's still alive and remember the past with nostalgia and wanted to try to do it again. There won't be any more repeats of this. So that's very important to keep in mind because that means that Ukraine uh, opens up. Uh, Ukraine is the last fantastic great opportunity in Europe. Every other European country is developed, uh, well invested, uh, results in a great living standard, great trade, and so on. Uh, we often compare Ukraine to Poland. Uh, it's, a, it's a good comparison and a bad comparison. Uh, a good comparison because, yeah, countries are roughly comparable. A bad comparison is because starting conditions of Ukraine and Poland were very, very, very different. I was in Poland from 75 to 81 many, many times on academic exchanges. I used to be a professor, now I am again. Um, and you couldn't compare Poland of 1975 with Ukraine of even 1995. Ukraine was far, far behind, different starting conditions, didn't have its own government, didn't have its own ministries, didn't have its own parliament. Uh, President Kravchuk, for the first year and a half, tried to make a list of all the uh, businesses and companies and uh, factories and so on in Ukraine, and he had trouble because many of them secretly continued to report to Russia. Same in this revolution. Many continue to secretly sell arms to Russia while there was a revolution going on. So this has been a, a, a major, major problem. Um, but uh, all of the necessary reforms have been made in Ukraine, except for the last stretch. We're into the last stretch. Remember, they started with Perestroika and Gorbachev. Some of you guys may remember that. <laughs> Old guys like me remember that. Uh, and then uh, it, we went to the beginning of the 1990s, which is a very horrible experience. Ukraine went to a free fall. Its GDP fell by 70%, 70, okay? Unprecedented drop. Uh, and Ukraine has been climbing out of that hole ever since through, uh, through gradual reforms. Now, I have to say that uh, the Vikings were not the first to come to Ukraine uh, after 1991. Uh, a lot of multinational companies took the chance and came to Ukraine. And I'll talk about that a little bit later because I was very, very much involved uh, with that experience. Um, 
Okay? So I think the two main points to make on political outlook are, number one, the worst is past, and number two, uh, the great stuff is about to begin. Yeah? Now, the second uh, topic that I'm to speak on uh, is investment potential. Uh, and then I come back again to the Viking experience. Why did the Vikings come to Ukraine? Because it was at the crossroads of the world. Uh, you had Byzantium to the south, you had Scandinavia to the north, you had the rich trade uh, from the east, uh, the Silk Road that was coming across the Black Sea steppes, and you had Western Europe. Uh, has anything changed? I think that's there. Ukraine was highly endowed. It was valued for its grain. It was valued for its uh, honey and furs and so on and so on. Uh, has anything changed? Yeah, Ukraine is now a very powerful economy. Uh, may look a little bit rusty, but it's there. In 1989, if you separated out the Ukrainian SSR from the general USSR statistics, the Ukrainian economy is the 13th largest in the world. The Polish economy was the 26th largest in the world. Just to give you an idea of, uh, of what that potential was. Um, a lot of those industries are still there. A lot of those industries are still leading industries. Those are industries that Russia wants. Ready to invade and take. And somehow the West always keeps looking the other way. It says, oh, we don't see anything there. Uh, now, in part, that's the fault of the Ukrainians. I remember uh, going back to my experience in the 1990s, 92, uh, actually three, four, five, in those years, bringing in companies like Boeing to meet with Antonov. Uh, bringing in investors to places like the titanium uh, manganese uh, uh, combinat, uh, and so on. The problem then were the so-called red directors. They knew how to steal already then. They had their old buddies and friends, uh, and they didn't believe in Ukrainian independence. And so it was impossible then to realize a vision, which was to take every one of these large industries, which were basically oligopoly industries, and to find a foreign partner for each and every one of them. That's something that I tried to do. Uh, one obstacle then was nuclear weapons. Ukraine had to give up its nuclear weapons. That was a clear demand from the West. I remember every moment of those years. Clear demand, give up your weapons or we will have nothing to do with you. Uh, the United States wouldn't give its OPEC uh, guarantees unless nuclear weapons were given up. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. It shipped tactical nuclear weapons to Russia. They're still there. We don't know exactly where. They could be back in Crimea. Yeah? Ukraine cut up its missiles, destroyed its silos, and got a Budapest memorandum. Iran wants guarantees. North Korea wants guarantees. The Budapest memorandum is a statement to everybody. You either follow through or you will have a collapsing world order. And I'm very glad that Norway is a fantastic friend of, of Ukraine and supports Ukraine. Um, now, to move on to <laughs> something more serious. Um, let's see. So as I was saying, this is a great opportunity measured by the, the gap between Poland and Ukraine. Ukraine can quickly accelerate to where Poland is. All right. um, and thirdly, somebody mentioned here, bargain basement prices. If you have some loose cash guys, this is the kind of time to come to Ukraine. But when we talk about export-import, it's small potatoes compared to the investment opportunity. If you in Norway would like to have products from Ukraine to your quality, to your quantity, and have even more which you can sell throughout the world, come and make the investment in Ukraine. Build those factories, the fish factories, and so on. That was suggested to the fish food factory. And that's just the beginning. That's just a Klondike of opportunities uh, that require capital. Norway is a country that's reliant on natural resources. Uh, it is at the edge of Europe, the other edge of Europe, very much integrally part of Europe, uh, but at the edge. And it should look for, it seems to me, ways of developing a strong international business base. And I think Ukraine offers that opportunity. It's time for the Vikings to come back. Um, in agriculture, uh, the big obstacle in agriculture has been the sale of land. This is a horrible situation. 
These poor farmers have had the land taken away from them in the 1920s and 30s through collectivization, and anywhere between five and 10 million were starved to death in a deliberate famine to force them to give up their land and to go into collective farms. Uh, when Ukraine became independent, the socialists and the communists said, no, we don't want to give away this land. The collective farms have to exist. In, January, in December of 1999, President Kuchma said, that's the end of collective farms. He marched the Verkhovna Rada into another location. Communists and socialists stayed behind. They voted through all the necessary changes. Ukraine's had a lot of reform history, exciting, dramatic reform history. But there was one little catch, and the catch was, yeah, the land now belongs to, 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 to the farmers, but they can't sell it. That's wonderful. All they can do is rent it to large farms that come in and rent at rock bottom prices. And, it, and slowly but surely, all of these farmers are dying. Demographics. A million have passed away and given up their plots. Uh, question of heirs. Well, the latest buzz in government, I think, or from another, is that on uh, the end of this year, or January 1st, uh, President uh, Poroshenko will repeat uh, President Kuchma's dramatic move, and I think we will have land that will sell. If land sells, if there's a real owner of land, if land can be then used as collateral for loans and banks and so on, even if foreigners aren't allowed to own farmland, there's a lot of sensitivity around it in many, many countries, I think that represents a fantastic opportunity for foreign investors. Ukraine has the capability of supplementing the daily ration uh, of up to one billion people on this earth. It's black earth, 30% of the world's black earth can feed in that supplement way up to a billion people. Oh, that's a fantastic business opportunity to get in and start taking in that kind of a one seventh of the earth's population market. You know? um, Ukraine has the potential to uh, produce not 60 million grains, a uh, million tons of grain, but 120 million tons of grain. This is all in studies done by very serious organizations. It's doubling today's output through better land utilization, more intensive cultivation, uh, better uh, care of the land when there are real owners instead of uh, owners who come in and just rent and use. Um, value added. Don't stop at the main, main commodity. Continue on to value added. Fish feed is value added. Um, I worked for a company called MHP, which uh, is a meat and poultry producer, which has the highest profit margins in the world. Its EBITDA margin is 35%, roughly, plus minus. Fantastic. Why? Vertical integration. You grow your grain, you make your feed, you sell your feed, you sell oil, and so on, you sell cake. You feed, you take this feed, you feed it to every form of flying and walking animal, uh, especially poultry. Um, you sell this poultry, you build the biggest plant in Europe, in La Vision, in Minska Oblast, which is now, which was built with foresight to supply the European market. It's selling 30,000 tons now. It was built with European inspectors unofficially inspecting the plant, inspecting the plant so that there wouldn't be any problems later. And these are visionary people. This is, by the way, a local Ukrainian with this great vision, who built this enormous, enormous uh, complex, uh, all on value added. The money is in value added, uh, not in the basic commodities. So come and invest into that. Now, um, when I was with Kraft Foods, I was with Kraft Foods from 1995 to 2011. Uh, another uh, value-added agricultural business, you would say. Uh, we started. Uh, we started in 1995. 1995 was a bad year in Ukraine. Massive devaluation, hyperinflation, collapsing economy. Kraft Foods, not Vikings, just these people from Chicago, came in, and yeah, we started a business with one small chocolate factory bought at rock bottom prices, four million dollars. It was a law firm. I'll tell you great that took care of that for us. Four million dollars for a chocolate factory is considered one of the two premier chocolate factories in the Soviet Union. Four million bucks. From that business, we went from one category to six. We added coffee. Yakub's coffee, I think you know. 
and other brands. Uh, milk, you know, is chocolate, of course. We had our local brands in each case. We went to the potato farming business, and we had to make potato chips. The sweets helped us. Remember the brand Estrella, Kraft Foods brand, uh, and we became number one in potato chips with a 70 percent market share. These are very tough years. We started our business in 2008. That, as I recall, was a crisis year, as well as 2009 and uh, a little bit further on. I'm sorry, we started the business in the year 1999. Okay. Um, on and on. Uh, biscuits. Uh, we built a huge biscuit factory in eastern Ukraine. 80% of that export is, uh, product is, is destined for export. For Kraft Foods, Ukraine was becoming a manufacturing platform for sale to the east, sale to the west, south, and north. Other companies, before we ran into these political problems of around 2011, 12, 13, had the same idea. I once was in playing with a banker. He said, Ukraine, Ukraine is China in Europe. Ukraine has a has vast potential for being a manufacturing platform. It's a huge industrial country as well as agricultural country. It has a highly trained workforce. It has scientists, scholars, engineers, uh, all ready to produce. We can assemble or produce anything. Well, Ukraine produces rockets that launch satellites. Ukraine produces the heaviest lift aircraft in the world. Uh, Ukraine has industries uh, that could, to some degree, fit in with uh, uh, Norwegian uh, uh, competencies. And anyway, you know, if you have the money, you can always find the competent people as well, and you can put together deals. Norway has money, uh, and is looking for ways to invest it. Um, well, uh, there's no reason why Far Eastern companies couldn't come to Ukraine and produce for the EU market with just-in-time deliveries. The Ukrainian worker today is at, is at, a, at half to one-third the price of a Chinese worker. You can have three Ukrainians working instead of one China. You understand? All the fantastic potential there. Um, let me just go on a little bit further. Uh, State-owned enterprises. I chair a committee uh, which selects the heads of state-owned enterprises. And yes, we selected the head of Uka Hasbank. Five ministers, the head of the World Bank in Ukraine, uh, uh, IFC and EBRD, all of us sat together and pick this person. Uh, we, of course, had some other experiences uh, before uh, that, and some choices, and there is a list, as you pointed out. Every one of these state-owned enterprises will be looked at carefully to, to see how it can be transformed into functional, working enterprises that produce profits and dividends and pay taxes, instead of being corruption holes, sink holes. Um, Norway has a great history of transparency in state-owned enterprises. As does your neighboring country, Sweden. We need your help to get these, countries, these companies to be managed properly, transparently, efficiently, with modern management. At the KU School of Economics, we're building programs to teach the CEOs and their boards of management how to properly manage companies. We need your help to expand these programs. We're talking about Top 100, top 61, 77, a number of areas of almost every day. Of companies that are, are huge and account for a very large part. Uber is the the railway system is the third largest in Europe by passenger traffic, fifth largest in Europe by freight traffic. The scale is absolutely frightening in a way. And it's just sitting there, waiting for somebody to come in and do something. And we need your help, you can't, you can't do it by itself. Um, heavy industry? and look at it. Um, okay, uh, one more thing, somebody said education, yes. Uh, we at the Cape School of Economics have a master's program, two master's programs in economics. They're taught entirely in English. Uh, why are they taught in English? So that scholars from the very beginning can access world literature, write for world publications, and, and, our, pub, and our scholars are in that group. Um, of the top 200 best economists in the world, one of our graduates is, is Yuri Vodnichenko is one of them. We produced 104 PhDs, 40 are studying for their PhDs. 10 have come back and are teaching at KSC. We just launched an MBA program 
also in English. By the way, these programs can't be licensed in Ukraine. They don't meet state education requirements because they're taught in English and the curriculum is different than some bureaucrat decides in the ministry. The curriculum is that which is needed and has proven to be needed by uh, world scholars, world scholarship and business. And so we launched an English language MBA program as well, the purpose of which is to prepare managers for dealing with the European market. You can't do it with translators. You can't do it if you don't have the same marketing concepts, the same business practices. You can't do it if you don't have the same business culture. So you have to teach and learn and train and develop. Um, I think I'll, I'll pretty much wrap up with this. Um, I just want to say that I came to Ukraine first, at first in 1992 to set up Roger Reynolds Tobacco. That was a horrible time. That is a value-added agricultural business. You grow tobacco, and then you poison people. Uh, we, <laughs> that's why I left very quickly. But in 1992-1993, with Western know-how, and I'm a PhD in macroeconomics and econometrics. I'm not a businessman. Okay? I'm just this, as we say in New York, schmucky professor. You could get 60% production share just by using common sense modern methods. After that, I joined KPMG. I started up KPMG in Ukraine. We, we helped start the Banking Academy with, uh, with funding. We brought an intergroup in Ukraine. You all know you. Okay. Uh, after that came the other breweries. Carlsberg, his other neighbors, tried it in afterwards at once somebody else tested the water, right? It was okay. All these companies, including Kraft and so on, have made enormous money, have made tremendous investments, have provided great returns. And they don't really brag about it. I didn't brag about Kraft Foods because I was afraid that would bring Nestle in. Nestle came in anyway in 1987. And Nestle's made a pile of money. The businesses that came into Ukraine, the foreign businesses that came to Ukraine, we're talking about Norwegian possible businesses, have made money. I have never had a problem with any government official. I have paid my taxes. I've had Azaro hang uh, the, uh, the poem on my wall that I'm the best, one of the best, best taxpayers in Ukraine. If you do your business transparently, if, you know, if everybody knows you're serious about that, then the courts will give just verdicts. You don't have to bribe judges. Uh, everybody's admires you, respects you, and is afraid of you. So business must be done cleanly, transparently, pay your taxes, don't bribe anybody, uh, and if that, if you don't believe it, then look at the history of all the international companies in Ukraine. They're still there. Nobody's exited. Nobody's left. Nobody's plans to leave. Jump into the pool. The war is warm. Thanks. Should you organize something, you know? Uh, we all need to crowd around uh, this table. So, next point is sort of kind of summing up in the um, panel discussion. Uh, Andre, where are you? Here. Uh, while they are sort of lining up the panel, uh, George talked about the historic connection between Ukraine and, and Norway. and. For the Ukrainian here, that the first time is in Oslo. The first queen in Oslo actually was Ukrainian. Some, some, say. some say that um, Oslo was founded in 1055, and at that time, Norwegian king was now yeah. Horode, and he was married to Elisveta, the daughter of Yaroslav, the great prince. So the first queen here in Oslo was Ukrainian. And actually there has been one more queen from Ukraine after that. So uh, this is a Ukrainian village actually. Thank you for picking up on that thing. Before we come to that, do you take it home? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take that. If everybody can just sit down, sit down. We'll, we'll pick up the screen. Uh, the tables are... it, it, this seems that this seems to be that have been planned by Ukrainians. Uh, <laughs> joking. Uh, not enough chairs, not enough tables, too many people. <laughs> well, I, I said that jokingly because you know that's the reputation that sometimes is ascribed to Ukrainians. Um, so, we have uh, eight people, 
And at three minutes each, that's 25 minutes, roughly. Uh, but we've been extended another 20 minutes. So now we have 45 minutes uh, and eight people. So uh, we can start. Uh, I have to moderate this. It's my great pleasure and honor, and I hope I don't disappoint you and the audience. Um, the discussion here is how to capitalize on the FTA and how to increase Norwegian-Ukrainian trade. Well, I think we've heard a lot from the panel on that. Uh, and so my thought is that perhaps we can start by opening questions and then get into an exciting discussion, either among ourselves or with the audience. Sounds good? Okay. Then uh, is there anybody any out there that is carrying a microphone around so that we can hear people asking questions? Yes. Good. <laughs> We're getting organized. Just don't take mine. Huh. Would anybody who would like to break the ice ask the first question? Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Biaga and I work in a company called Elopac and we are actually refining products, refining uh, what we call port. Can you speak more loudly? If they, well, they have to turn it up. No? Is this better? Yeah. Perfect. So we are producing uh, milk cartons, juice cartons, having a factory in uh, Bastel, south of, of Kiev. And we went in there in 93, I believe. So we've also been there for quite a while. And uh, all these uh, people all said, oh, business and opportunities in Ukraine are great. But there's also quite a lot of problems in doing business in Ukraine, I believe especially if you actually try to produce in the country for exporting purposes. When we import our raw materials, we meet customs. You want to export again, you don't retrieve the customs. So you are penalized by producing in the country. If you want to do toll manufacturing, because that is actually a possibility, then you get the raw materials in and you get it out again. But then the Ukrainian government say, well, in this country you have to add 10% of profit, while in other parts of Europe it's only 5 And low margin business, that's not easy. So in that way you're always finding hindrances. What is then happening recently? Well, you can't exchange your money any longer. Then you have to be very careful and say, we have to plan to get that bills paid. You have to go to the bank, you have to see if you can exchange. You're getting income in Euro, you're forced to exchange it to your revenues. And you can then not exchange back when you have to pay your suppliers. It's not an easy way for Western Europeans to invest and do business. Uh, let, let me take a first stab at it because uh, I've, I've been in, in Ukraine for, for, for so long doing uh, uh, doing business myself. Um, yeah, uh, and, and these problems uh, have gotten worse uh, in the last uh, four years and uh, 46 million people said, enough. Uh, now the question is, how fast can we get the government to uh, change this? Uh, VAT issues, uh, 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 duty issues. Uh, tolling arrangements, by the way, were a hallmark of business in Ukraine in the beginning of the 1990s uh, when there were currency issues as well. So uh, generally, everybody frowns on that. And I think we also have to make an allowance for the fact that today Ukraine faces three major problems which we think will be resolved soon enough. One is reforms. Everybody's working on that in spite of the war. Number two, uh, a falling economy, which is a big issue. But we've went through that before when the economy was there since 1991. You went through a 70% drop in GDP. Then you were there in 1998 and there in 2008. We know we can get out of that. Uh, and currency, I think there's a concern now because of speculation and uh, deval. Uh, so there's a big issue in that currency restrictions fall into, no, normally into all countries that have those kinds of problems. And I think that eventually they'll be removed as well. The frame is moving towards a free convertible currency. But th that was just my brief comment. Anybody else want to address that? Lawyers, maybe? Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, they're actually very, very important for all the businesses in Ukraine right now. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, those current currency problems, currency restrictions, which are in place in Ukraine, and uh, import duty problems, uh, they are of temporary nature. That is, uh, 
for sure, because a lot of business uh, right now raise this question. And uh, the government of Ukraine already uh, confirms that, uh, for example, import duty uh, can be cancelled by the end of the year, not uh, even, um, I mean, it was meant to, to, to have for one year, but uh, maybe it can be cancelled by the end of the calendar year. Uh, it, it depends actually how strong the business will be in their, uh, in their uh, voice, like raising these problems. Um, and uh, the currency restrictions and the import duty are also under the scrutiny and control uh, from, from the side of uh, international fund, uh, monetary fund and other organizations. So uh, IMF uh, has its own program of reforms uh, introduced in Ukraine and uh, followed closely. Uh, so all these uh, all these all these uh, steps were coordinated and agreed with the IMF. Uh, and it's mostly because of a macroeconomic situation. Um, I can't uh, I can't comment on economic issues because I'm not an economist, but that's what I uh, read uh, from the IMF materials papers. Uh, so I think that it's also um, uh, advisable to uh, speak to IMF representatives, to World Bank representatives, to understand how long it will last and uh, what business can do uh, to to uh, reduce. Uh, the negative effect from this. Thank you for a question. And, uh, there is a special custom regime for such uh, producers like you who import uh, raw materials and export uh, uh, goods. But uh, as I understand, uh, <coughs> uh, there was no practice to use it. And we heard uh, this question from tobacco companies. So we could. Uh, continue conversation with you just to do what you do with it. So you have somebody to talk to. Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I would like to be very practical. So I will give you a context. There are some exceptions, talking about export and talking about uh, um, exchange currency return and prepayment. There are uh, exceptions in the order of the National Bank of Ukraine. It's uh, one, two, four. The order. So there are exceptions possible. And just for your information, we had a meeting with top 10 uh, importers of grain and seeds to Ukraine, and we discussed with them how to find some solution. And National Bank have a possibility have exceptions for companies which are uh, well known, which are white, which are foreign companies, and there are possibilities to solve this uh, currency issue, which uh, we know now in Ukraine. And the main reason of the implementation, this limitation, was to stop the panic, which happened about one month ago when we had a uh, situation in the currency. Uh, in Ukraine, it was like up to 40, from 25 to 40. So it was panic, and these actions were took, took, uh, took in place just to stop the panic, and the result was very positive. So right now, we see already that there is a stabilization of exchange rate in Ukraine. And uh, I will give a context of National Bank uh, people, also new people, new team there. There are some possibilities to improve the situation for you personally. Thank you. Other questions? Don't be shy. innovation uh, of startup business, startup everywhere. 
uh, I, I wish really to get more information about the uh, development delegates in Ukraine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I will comment on this and uh, maybe Denise also will add a few words. Uh, actually, within the Ministry of Economy, now the uh, new department has been created, which is uh, devoted to all digital uh, issues. And it combines very broad functions, like uh, development, uh, if, if, you go up, if you talk about IT industry, everything, digitalizing of everything, e-government, e-commerce, uh, a lot of uh, these functions are concentrated in this depart new department. The head of the department is actually a former CEO of big uh, telecommunication company in Ukraine and uh, she also worked uh, for 10 years in Europe as a CEO. So she's a very competent and uh, uh, she's well known in Europe as well. And uh, she works like about two or three weeks by the time. So I can contact you personally with her. And uh, she is very welcoming all the new contacts and business, of course. And I uh, already done this uh, last week for uh, several of people, so I can I can provide the contacts. Yeah, I, I can add. I share something called the Brain Basket Foundation, which unites all of the uh, hardware software companies of Ukraine. Uh, you can find it very easily uh, in the internet. Uh, drop me a line, and we'll see if we can get you in contact with some companies in Ukraine as well. Uh, IT is one of the hot issues for the Ukrainian government. It sees it as one of the bright prospects for rapid growth. The other one, of course, is agriculture. And since we're here, uh, Norwegians and Ukrainians talking about agriculture, and there's this whole issue of uh, the agricultural bilateral agreement. Uh, I see stirred a lot, a lot of interest on that. Uh, maybe we can start talking about that a little bit too, about how we can go about uh, uh, getting a, a better agreement in place and uh, participation from the audience, panel. Anybody want to start that discussion? I have one more question. Uh, let, let's, let's do the bilateral, then we go to the other question. Is that about uh, bilateral? Or is that a different question? No, no, okay. it was not. Oh, we'll go through. Let's do this by, or in an orderly way. From the uh, Ukrainian side, perhaps, uh, some comments on uh, the bilateral agreement? some discussion with colleagues from Norway, from ministries, and we see the understanding of what is necessary to be done. And uh, we will need to make some homework, because uh, a lot of things that we discussed today, it is uh, absolutely Ukrainian part that is necessary to initiate this process. And we have understanding what to do, and we have uh, more or less time frames, and uh, we have understanding of the people who will take those actions. So this is very important, and uh, we as far as I understand, we will start those sessions already this week after coming back to Ukraine because uh, we are not to complain that something is not done because if somebody didn't do something, we need to do that. And this is the main message that I've got from today and that I would like to convey to everybody and also to my colleagues that it, it has to be done and I see great support from the Norwegian side and I'm very much pleased about that. And. Uh, so it, it is the only way we need to do is to make an action plan and to make it realistic. Any, any, any comments from the Norwegian side? Maybe we can make this more of a, a discussion and dialogue. Uh, my name is Dal uh, I'm, I'm from the Federation of Norwegian Food and Drink Industry, or Food Drink Norway, as we call it now. Uh, I represent uh, 1,500 companies uh, with uh, 40,000 employees in the in the food uh, in the agricultural based food industry. Um, uh, our members are companies, uh, and and uh, companies compete. <coughs> companies need to earn money, uh, and uh, and we uh, we have some principles that we. Uh, we, we put forward in all discussions like this. Uh, we need predictab predictability. Uh, uh, we love harmonized rules, uh, the same rules as, uh, as for instance, in the union. Uh, we, we love simplicity, uh, and, and we hate surprises. Um, 
and 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 there are uh, there are things happening in the trade uh, that is not uh, not as good uh, when when you put forward these principles. Uh, it could be better, uh, but I I I think it's very important uh, to 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 uh, cheer and say thank you to to the the government of Ukraine uh, for for trying to to mend some of the things uh, that has not been as good as it should be. Um, we, we, we don't have too many offensive uh, uh, interests from Norwegian agricultural based food industry towards trade. Uh, but, but we would like to, to uh, uh, have some, some more access to the market for uh, meat byproducts or plus products as we love to call it. Um, uh, and and for, for human consumption, and uh, we see that we could probably uh, import more uh, more wheat grain for human consumption, and uh, but we ne we need some help from the Norwegian government there uh, to to see to it that uh, that we compensate a little bit for the quite difficult logistics as as we heard about late, uh, earlier. Thank you. Any further discussion on this? On this topic? Yeah. Yes, please. Microphone there. It sounds like the, the right way to do this would be to bring together a, a third party. Norwegian and, uh, and Ukrainian government uh, counterparts and business and sit around the table, uh, have a round table discussion around this and come up with uh, some principles. I know there's, a, there's some discussion that goes on about the uh, DCFTA in general, and there was some dissatisfaction represent, uh, expressed by business about how it was negotiated, and business wasn't always involved in the negotiation process, somebody's making decisions for business. So business should be very, very much integrally involved in this. Yes, please. to be here. Uh, I was wondering, like, um, I guess for Norwegian business, as I understand and having some uh, view regarding what Norwegian companies require in order to actually do business with Ukraine, is uh, first harmonized standards with European ones, as, uh, um, as was mentioned before. I was wondering, um, is there any like expectations regarding when it will be done? Or like at least some forecasts. Um, yeah. So representing the Ministry of Agriculture and Economic Development. Yeah. Or also, and and uh, sorry, but the second question, one more, just just to say, it uh, also Ukrainian producers when they want to export, they uh, face such a problem that you have to have a lot of contracts, a lot of documentations with uh, like another side of partner in order to actually uh, do it somehow. Like, and uh, for instance, if you sign a contract with the company, sometimes it is not really kind of, there are some clarifications which needs to be done and you need amendments that should be signed by another party. When in Europe it's usually kind of, uh, it is based on trust and uh, I guess that's also another problem which kind of, which fears Norwegian uh, companies uh, and not only Norwegian companies to deal with the Ukrainian ones. Maybe could you clarify what is going on right now in terms of legislation? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'll probably start and my colleagues will add. Uh, first of all, uh, about your question on harmonization of standards. Uh, the uh, special resolution of cabinet of ministers of Ukraine has been passed, uh, which uh, regulates what should be done uh, for harmonization process in different ministries. So, um, in relation to each uh, in, to each uh, direction, a certain ministry has been appointed as responsible for uh, harmonization process. And each ministry was responsible to provide action plan, roadmap, of this harmonization uh, process, uh, which consists of uh, different legal acts to be adopted uh, in a certain timeline. Uh, 
so this this is the process, long one, because uh, the Ukrainian legislation, the Ukrainian not only legislation but also infrastructure and all other aspects should be uh, changed, should be updated uh, to the European standard and that's not not the matter of one year, of course. This is a process which should be, of course, controlled uh, and followed. Uh, regarding your question on the docu documents uh, supporting the uh, trading operations, uh, first, it's a matter of legal culture. It's different from the European one. We have a kind of uh, Soviet heritage uh, of legal culture. Uh, we used to have a lot of documents, contracts, appendices, etc., etc. Uh, on the other hand, the Ukrainian law provides for opportunity to have uh, more simplified uh, forms of documents, like invoices or uh, other um, supporting uh, docu documents supporting the transaction uh, can be considered as agreement uh, based on the law. Um, and uh, all others, there are also other uh, simplified procedures of uh, agreement. So it depends on the parties only, how they want to regulate their contractual relationship. Uh, in my practice, we have different forms of these uh, documents. It could be uh, long contracts or it could be just one invoice. It depends on trust, of course. If they have a long-standing relationship uh, with a big history, uh, they regulate in framework agreement basic things and afterwards they just uh, trade in it. So it's, Ukrainian legislation is very flexible in this regard. Of course, uh, it is advisable to have a foreign economic contract if, if you have, if you understand, if you talk about a foreign activity abroad in Ukraine, then you have to show it to the customs authority, to the bank, in order to prove that you have a, trading relationship contracts in order to transfer the funds and goods. So, uh, but the length and the uh, complexity of the contract, of course, depends on uh, the parties. There is a law that uh, many standards uh, we adopt from the European Union since uh, next year. So, there is already uh, the law. And, uh, we are working on the other standards, so it should be done in the nearest future. And uh, fighting this, lots of documents that call with deregulation. So we are in the process now. I would like to add, talking about harmonization, it's really ongoing process right now. And uh, harmonization of standards with European Union is uh, organized and managed by ministers, but I would like to mention that some companies which are interested in European markets, for example, like MHP, company that uh, Ms. Logos mentioned today, from the first stone of greenfield production, they were very much European-oriented, and they fulfilled all the production, all the process in accordance with European legislation. So, private business which is interested in export and interested in European supply is making their own harmonization much more effectively and much more quickly. I would like also to add that talking about trust regulation and also harmonization, Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food have very nice uh, initiative right now. So we are developing together with European specialists and experts, we are developing a strategy of agricultural development till uh, 2020 and this strategy is already have a status of a public discussion and each of you can find this preliminary strategy on our website of the ministry in English and each of you can participate in building this strategy for Ukraine and propose some ideas for the future. In this strategy you can um, also find the regulation topics, you can find uh, harmonization of legislation of Ukraine and you can make your own input into developing of strategy of agriculture uh, in Ukraine. And I would like to encourage you to do that. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion among ourselves on the panel. I understand that uh, Mr. Uh, Bjorkili, yeah? Uh, you said you indicated you needed tariff reductions in order to uh, boost import. Could you address that a little bit more in detail? If we have to boost uh, it, I think we need to uh, <coughs> reduce it like it's been, been done with uh, Kazakhstan. Just take uh, 
reduction of the taxes because then it's I think we can uh, at the same point of uh, uh, having uh, the rain coming like having the start point from the Baltics and then it's the same price level I think as uh, the Baltic uh, grain and then it's maybe it could be a start point to uh, get more of uh, this kind of grain into our, uh, Norwegian products. Uh, uh, ourselves, we are thinking now because of the currency, starting off with maybe uh, do something uh, with the uh, Dilvum, just test with the uh, thousand tons uh, from uh, Ukraine instead of from Canada, just to get some uh, experience about doing a uh, business with Ukraine. As we discussed today, we would like also to think about added value products and what we would like to see a possibility of cooperation with flour, with wheat flour. And there are now a lot of technologies of uh, wheat flour standardization <coughs> and at the end you can get a product that will satisfy the consumers. But it's the question of uh, your needs. Um, but talking about Kazakhstan, I would like just to mention that Kazakhstan a little bit in front of us uh, in terms of special tariffs for railway, for wheat and for flour. Mm -hmm. And they're dotating this segment just to accelerate the export. And now we are in uh, contact with our Minister of Infrastructure, the Ukrainian railway uh, company, to find some way how we can accelerate export of wheat and wheat flour outside Ukraine, maybe using the same example as Kazakhstan is doing now, but they're doing pretty well and we see that Kazakhstan is increasing export of uh, their grains and also added value products like flour. And we are also interested in added value product development and improving export. Uh, listen to what you just said, I'd like to, uh, yes, uh, refer to our uh, advisor to the minister. The industry. Uh, this whole issue of non-inclusion of sunflower and other uh, commodities. Uh, could you please comment on that? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just to your question, I think the issue of sunflower might be a misunderstanding because sunflower is uh, sunflower oil, maybe not the, not the kernel, not, not the seed kernel as such, but the oil and the oil cakes are included duty free. Um, I think it's very positive that Norges Mölle is here, and I thought it was very interesting to hear your view from the actual economic operator, uh, how things are working and, and possibly not working. Uh, what I particularly like is that you are trying with the current uh, options and agreements and, and trying to utilize that <coughs> and, um, and export or, or trying to import and try out products. I, I do hear and do understand that Kazakhstan, for some products, are more interesting because they have uh, the tariff preference, which is granted to Kazakhstan through the general system of preferences, which is uh, to these less developed countries. Since there is an agreement in force between EFTA and uh, Ukraine, the system is uh, uh, abolished. And uh, it, it should be such that the new trade agreement should be better than the old uh, regime. Um, but uh, the preference for grain is not bound in the new agreement. It's actually it has not bound this with any any trading partner, and not even the EU. So this is a temporary regime that uh, Kazakhstan is uh, also utilizing. But what I do, of course, understand this is something that's attractive, and, and there is a pause in the agreement for further liberalization, and I think that's the pathway where this uh, should be looked into. But there are, as I said, there are also. Like you said, the durum wheat is already in the agreement, and this can be looked into, and there are other preferences as well that are not utilized uh, for time being. Uh, and just uh, your proposal of uh, uh, connecting uh, both governmental officials and uh, government uh, economic operators, I think, is a, is a good idea. We actually had a visit from Ukraine to the Minister of Agriculture last month, mainly regarding fisheries, but uh, it was also uh, a part on, on agriculture that we met and discussed. So I think it's good to establish contact, especially now when we understand there's quite a new, new workforce in, in the ministries as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, I think uh, another thing could be uh, uh, 
been done is to, to focus on um, product with the, for us with the, the highest quality because I think the, uh, the, it's possible to make uh, grain with quite high uh, protein and I think if uh, you can that's not so big amount but it's uh, people are willing to buying it instead of uh, it's uh, the average uh, grain it's possible to get a higher price as well so if you are selecting all of the highest protein uh, uh, wheat. I think it could be possible to make uh, business of that as well. But uh, then you have to collect and be good to have that in uh, in silos with just that kind of uh, quality. And I think that uh, a lot of uh, company in Europe is interesting just to not in big volume, but it's they, they need it for some products. And then coming back to the issue of bringing government officials and uh, the players in the industry together, I guess the, the Food and Drink Association would also support this and participate in this kind of a process. And how does that sound then on the Ukrainian side? Uh, to get government officials together from both sides, uh, have industry participation, I think then we could hammer out an agreement uh, which everybody will be happy with and uh, uh, win-win with very few uh, tears afterwards. Is that possible? I just would like to add that now our ministry, Ministry of Agrarian uh, and Policy, is in close contact with business, not directly with producers, but mainly with associations, which are covering different segments of and different industries. And it's a great idea also to involve those associations who are representing the business and representing producers. So there is a grain association, for example, which for sure will be interested in looking at uh, this agreement there are uh, association of uh, wheat flour production and processors and of course there are association of fish producers which can be of interest so I uh, absolutely support in this idea that we need to combine all uh, the best proposals and ideas from business from government from both parts and arrange this round table which will work out, work out some documents which will satisfy all the parts and will be real, will be in document for countries, for businesses, and for government affairs also. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more colleague who hasn't spoken, please. But you start, uh, uh, this is actually to follow up uh, slightly to generalize what uh, uh, the last words from Marcus Monag uh, regarding like, high quality, <laughs> high protein wheat. I think that's something that can be generalized to a more uh, on a broader level. Um, because thinking about the future of Ukraine, one thing is agricultural products, but this goes for basically all. Is this is not my idea? This is something I think that President Poroshenko said in the fall that one of the ideas we're taking behind the strategy 2020 is that in a certain amount of years' time, when people you know, to make Ukraine a brand, so that when people see made in Ukraine, that's a sign of quality and not just. But it's uh, because it goes without saying that uh, Ukraine is a country that can produce enormous amounts of basically every pro every product imaginable. <coughs> but by, to underline that when something comes from Ukraine, that is a sign of quality and it's something you would like to pay a premium price for because it's good. That would, uh, in my opinion, be a good strategy for Ukraine in the years to come. I think also it's a very feasible strategy because uh, Ukraine is really in Ukraine a lot of uh, well-educated people uh, with a good uh, understanding of the production uh, and really that's what we can do. That's uh, a lot of things have been lost uh, during the several decades uh, because of the political and economical situation, but the potential. Just on, on, on the wheat one, we're talking about that. You know that. Hard wheat that's grown in the United States and in Canada, uh, Kansas Red and other varieties, uh, was actually brought from Ukraine by immigrants. Uh, they would travel with a, a bag of their personal belongings and two bags of grain. My father's uh, two half, three half brothers went to Edmonton that way. Uh, and Soviet agriculture destroyed hard wheat in Ukraine. Destroyed it. It's not available. Uh, and we, we have a coll your colleagues from Sweden who have the Chumak company uh, in Ukraine decided to make uh, pasta. Uh, they thought hard wheat in Ukraine, and they ended up uh, importing from all places Egypt. So it's, it's kind of bizarre. 
I think there was a question in the back that we interrupted uh, because it was all theme. Perhaps we could uh, round up with that. Uh, or if you're willing to sacrifice your tapas no. and name them, uh, <laughs> then we can go on until the stars come out. Very short, I guess a lot of you are starting to get hungry. But there is one other thing. We talked about, uh, we talked about the big lines, about the micro laws and the premises uh, for doing trade with Ukraine and Norway. But there is one issue that is, you, like you said, George, that uh, Ukraine is very, like a key point, very central. But there are no direct flights between uh, Norway and Ukraine. And that's You're that. telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I saw my boys at 3 a.m. and got here at 1 p.m. <laughs> but, but for, you know, for, for individual uh, businesses, small businesses to find their own way into Ukraine and uh, and cooperate with uh, with businesses in Ukraine. That is some kind of problem. And uh, Norwegian used to have a direct flight between uh, Oslo and Kiev, but they put it down and I tried to ask them the reason, but uh, they, they didn't give me any answer for it. And, uh, and beside, if you book a ticket uh, on this uh, internet, internet booking companies. Uh, the easiest way to go from Oslo to Kiev is uh, between Stockholm, but uh, it seems like Ukraine international airways are not into these booking systems. So I, I don't know, is it possible for any of you guys to make any effort to change that, to make business for small companies easier? Yeah. Thank you. So, so you get an egg issue, isn't it? Uh, if we get business to grow enough, uh, Oh, we have the answer. Uh, it's coming out. It's coming out. Thank you. Before answering, I'd like to thank Mr. Lobish for the best impartial presentation of Ukraine. And uh, to tell the truth, uh, the issue of the establishing direct flight uh, between our countries was one of the issues as a result of the visit of Prime Minister, um, Prime Minister of Norway to Ukraine. And uh, this issue is on the discussions between our ministries of transportation. As I understand, the business is separated from the state in Norway. And uh, I just think that uh, on the government level, we, we can help to find the solution of this issue for our business. Just one more. Just ladies last as well as first. Please, more loudly. And in fact, uh, logistics in a way. Uh, we, have, uh, we are a co-investor in a farm in the Sony region in Ukraine, where we produce grain. And uh, one of the issues which is really being an impediment to the current development of the farm is logistics. Because we try to export grain from uh, Ukraine to, uh, uh, to Norway, uh, but logistics uh, turned out to be a real, real challenge. So this has been mentioned before, but I just wanted to use this opportunity to emphasize that I'm talking about this bilateral cooperation about the things and the point. Uh, Ukraine uh, logistics is really very important. Is that an issue that can be resolved by collective wisdom in this room? Uh, the Chamber of Commerce can perhaps assist in that issue, finding the best logistical pathways uh, so that you don't have to struggle on your own. Um, that might be a function of the chamber. In any case, I see that they're going to take this microphone away from me. <laughs> I want to thank you all very much on behalf of the panel and the audience. And uh, as we say in Ukrainian, uh, 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 Thank you very much. I wanted to wrap up well before Sigmund closes the meeting uh, to say thank you to all of you. Uh, and I can assure you that NUC will continue this work to uh, revise this agreement. It should be included corn, sunflower kernels, etc. It's not a challenge, not a competing with Norwegian producers, and uh, it would be helpful for Ukraine. But on the other hand, this should be a win-win situation. We like that in, uh, in Norway. 
And I'm sure that Norwegian uh, industry also has some uh, input for us. So we also want to continue to cooperate with the enterprise and with the companies here. So if you're anyone here from the agricultural industry or the food industry, please contact me afterwards and we will continue this uh, discussion with the Ukrainian and the Norwegian side and with the industry and the organization and the ministries and the embassy and everyone. So thank you all of you and we'll have a meeting with the Norwegian parliament members also uh, in the coming weeks. So this will go on. Thank you. Sigmund? No, aren't you that? <laughs> but thank you to everyone, so I, maybe I shouldn't do that, but anyhow, thank you to George and thank you to the rest of the panel and to all the speakers. Um, we have a kind of tradition in this in the NUCC meetings that one thing is sort of the hard fact that are presented from here, but just as important is the informal discussion where people meet face to face and talk about issues. That's why. That's why we have uh, organized now two hours, or maybe we are reduced it to half, one and a half now. To one, and one and a half hour of uh, tapas, uh, drinks, and informal discussions and conversation and exchange of experience. So I hope as many, as many of you as possible has the possibility to just move to the other side of the hallway and to find yourself something to eat, to find yourself a table to sit to, where you can find people that you would like to discuss with. And then you can discuss with these guys and the rest of the people here. So, looking forward to meeting you out in the cantina to be online, and they have some marvelous uh, tapas, actually. So, thank you for coming, and see you on the other side of the table. I don't know if you had to say no to someone, but uh, Sorry. did you have to say no to uh, well, we did. But we didn't, we had to stop advertising because of all of the After we implement the agenda, which was made up today, we will repeat it. <laughs> the event. Too much. You see, it's a success. Because now we should use the security. I think. Are you a participant in the in the course or are you sort of representing the He's married. It's okay. He can have two wives. No. no. According to Norwegian legislation, no. We, it's okay. 
it's okay. It's gonna be uh, informal. Ah, informal wise. Це цікаво. Ні, у мене дуже важлива місія, дівчата, тому мені треба всі презентації на флешку зараз загнати. Ні, так це секунда буквально. Я прийду з там, бачите? Що ти не спустив? Ви всі такі замовляли. А я з Ставагою. Я сама з України. Чути? А це в нього все закінчено працює? Так, і ні. Це в нього все закінчено працює. 